Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paddy Lillis and the Platform Party. Good morning, conference, and welcome to this session. Um, colleagues, we will start by receiving the report of the Conference Arrangements of Committee. So please welcome the Chair of the Committee, Harry Donaldson. Thanks, Chair. Conference, formally moving CAC 3. CAC are very pleased to timetable today two NEC statements. The first is an NEC statement on the Leaders' Policy Plan and is shown on pages 9 to 11 of the report. The second is an NEC statement on international trade, shown on page 11. A number of composite motions are also timetabled this morning. There will be a debate on the housing composite. The NHS composite will then be debated as part of the health and care debate. We will then hear speeches from the Shadow Leader of the House, Paul Flynn, TUC President Liz Snape, Cooperative Party Speaker Gareth Thomas, and Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. <laughs> Votes will then be taken on the NEC statements, Contemporary Composite 9, the Health and Care Policy Commission, Contemporary Composite 7, and the NEC and CLP rule changes. NEC and CLP rule changes are detailed in Appendix 1 and Appendix 2 on pages 19 through to 32. The NEC recommendations are shown on page 12 and will be shown on the screen during the votes. This afternoon, the Compsite on Grammar Schools will be debated as part of the Education and Children Policy Commission. The Compsite on Energy will also be debated this afternoon. Compsite motions can be found on pages 13 to 17 of the report. This afternoon we will hear speeches from Deputy Leader Tom Watson and Mayor of Bristol Marvin Rees. <laughs> Conference will adjourn at 4pm for policy seminars, the details of which can be found on page 8 of the report. The CAC has considered 14 emergency motions which are detailed on page 18. The CAC has a further one emergency motion to consider today. Today's ballot is for the National Constitutional Committee, CLP section, and voting takes place between 9 and 4 and is for the CLP delegates only. Conference, I move CAC 3. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Harry. Does anyone wish to ask any questions or make any points on the, on, on the Conference's Arrangements Committee report? Quentin yeah, yeah. Deacon. Delegate from Dweva Marionif, uh, CLP. Um, well, th th there's an elephant in the room, it seems to me. Um, I was expecting that if we're going to be talking about constitutional amendments, that somewhere would appear Tom Watson's proposals on the uh, shadow cabinet, but it doesn't appear it at all. I thought as a party, we'd move to putting everything before conference again. This is a major, major change that is being proposed by Tom Watson, and it is known about. It's a constitutional amendment. We should be talking about it. We'll have different views about it. I accept that, but it should be discussed, and it isn't being discussed today. I have my own take on it. I'm not going to elaborate at length, but if we compare the general election to a boat race, or the boat race, and we have Theresa May as Cox of one boat, and Jeremy Corbyn is cox of another, just make the point? then if half Jeremy Corbyn's team are rowing the opposite direction, we could be in trouble, the boat could sink, and we'll all suffer. Thank you, 
That's my point. Co colleagues, please wait, you know, make them brief. Mosbull at Reynolds, Newbury CLP. Just for clarification, Chair, is it the case that if delegates wish to vote against one of the NEC's constitutional amendments, then we need to vote against all of them? I ask for this clarification because I don't want to be forced to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Good morning, conference. I hope you had a good night. I had a great one. But, Chair, conference. You know, Manuel Cortez Transport Salary Staffs Association. You know, my union put forward a very simple but very clear emergency motion. An emergency motion that would have allowed you, the decision makers, the decision makers to consider each and every constitutional amendment on its merits rather than have them all put together. You know, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt they're going to come and tell you that we've always done it like this. But doing it like this has landed us on hot water. We were at the High Court not that long ago trying to get a High Court judge to interpret our rules. The reasons for that is because probably they were passed in haste in this place in a block. We need to learn. We need to learn from our mistakes. And that's why, and that's why, with a heavy heart, because I don't want to disrupt conference, everybody's enjoying this week. I think the Labour Party is coming back together behind our leader, and that's just great news. But with a heavy heart, I am moving a reference back, and it should be on a card vote. Will Holmes, Birmingham Union, Old Southwark, CLP, uh, first-time delegate. Um, <laughs> uh, conference, as a first-time delegate, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm dismayed by the amount of time we're going to spend talking about procedure. I'd, I'd, quite like, I'd quite like to spend the time debating the policies of the day that are going to make a difference for the people in this country and not talk about internal policy. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Mike Payne, GMB, and also the, uh, this year's Vice Chair of the Welsh Executive. Conference, we've got a lot of, a lot of things to, to get on with today. And um, I just wanted to give Conference some information. For two years, we've been talking to national offices of the Welsh Labour Party about the amendments you have in front of you today. And we were given assurances by um, both the leader and the deputy leader that we, uh, we, would, we would see these amendments supported. Those discussions were led by the Regional Secretary of Unite in Wales, and those assurances were given to him. We've had two NEC votes on these amendments. We've had a CAC report on Monday. It's about time we stopped the prevar uh, prevarication, comrades, and got on with it. Colleagues, can I ask those who are coming up to speak to be brief and to the point? There's quite a few wanting to come in. Good morning, conference. Matthew Van Royen, Bridgend CLP, first time delegate, first national conference. I'd just like to start by saying what a shame this is that some colleagues here today are trying to block and trying to stop uh, this voting. We're going to spend far too long debating whether we can vote on single motions instead of voting as a block vote. 
We need to be debating policies to put them into place, to take them forward and make us look like a Labour government. This is our one opportunity conference to make policy for us grassroots Labour members to make policy for the year ahead. We need to start making changes. We've got Jeremy Corbyn as leader, whether we like it or not, and we need to start... Go We need to go forward, conference. We need to make some policies and stop debating endless rule changes, which are completely pointless. We need to make policy and go forward for the year ahead. I support this motion. Colleagues, colleagues there's a, some individuals booing there. Be respectful to the speakers. You may not agree, but be respectful. <clears throat> Martin Phillips, New Forest West. I, I'd like a number of other speakers. I'm a bit confused by this. I thought that uh, conference decisions were sovereign. We voted on this. The NEC have voted on this. Why the hell are we wasting time going over this again and again and again just because some people don't like the result? Conference George McManus, uh, CLP rep for Beverly and Holderness. And nearly 20 years on the National Policy Forum representing Yorkshire and Humber CLPs. Whoa. Conference, the rule book is what keeps the Labour Party's foundation strong. The rule book <laughs> protects us from the anarchy that would attack us and sometimes from the courts. That's why we've got to get it right. I'm afraid we've been here before. And the, the, the method of trying to pass rule changes on block is something that is not an established protocol here. Martin's right, conference is the sovereign body. That's why we have to get these rule changes spot on. Presenting them on a take it or leave it basis when the NEC voted 15 votes for and 15 votes against is not a clear decision. <laughs> Accepting, this is the, unfortunately the NEC don't put out minutes, so this is the report that I've had. Accepting this approach will get us into more trouble. Let conference debate each decision line by line. Colleague, before you, before you start, look, there's quite, a, there's quite a number getting up to speak, and I don't want to stifle any debate. But if your point's been made, please don't repeat it. Uh, you're biting into conference time. <laughs> Delegate. Good morning, conference. I'm Christabel from Hammersmith. I'm a first-time delegate and a first-time speaker. <laughs> and I will be brief. Um, I've been so disappointed that every morning of the conference so far we've present, been presented with this motion to reference back, which, if it were passed, were to throw the entire conference, business of this conference, into chaos. We have the eyes of the country on us here, and a country that is desperately looking for solutions to its many, many problems. And it seems it makes Labour look pretty self-indulgent and, quite frankly, dysfunctional if all we're doing is having a debate about even whether we have a debate. Please, can we just get on with talking about how we make this country better rather than just talking about ourselves? Thank you, Chair. Conference. Steve Richardson from Aslef, first time delegate and first time speaker. Uh, 
Uh, the proposed NEC rule changes are too important and far too dissimilar to be treated as a single item. It's absurd. It's absurd that they have been presented to us as a take it or leave it, leave it package, given that the proposals range so much. At this time, more than ever, we need to remove the top-down democracy and avoid, avoid more damaging publicity. Do we really need to end up in court again, given that the rule changes are not that clear? Hello conference, uh, Kate Lewis from Salford Neckles CLP, first time delegate and first time speaker. We should not have to vote for the rule changes as a whole package. Some of these rule changes clearly need debate. Others have come about as a result of, of debate and consultations already, such as the sensible proposal to give women's conference policy-making powers. It is unfair to put delegates here in an untenable position of being fully supportive of some changes but desirous of debate for others while being given no option but to vote for the changes together in their entirety. The only way to solve this conundrum is to have a special conference to discuss the changes, so any resulting changes would be the result of fair and democratic process, respecting the voices and views of those in our party. As a new delegate, I had hoped my first time standing here in front of my comrades would be to say something positive about a way we might improve policy. I am disappointed that my first appearance is to make representation in favour of democracy, which I would expect to be a given. Thank you. Morning conference. My name is Samantha Bellamy. I'm a first time delegate um, and I'm from Worsley and Eccles South CLP. As a party member and a delegate, I feel disenfranchised by my conference grouping together all the rule changes. We're a democratic party and I personally feel that you're taking away from us as members by not letting us vote for the changes individually. Thank you. Terence Smith, Brigham Constituency. Conference, I urge you to support the CAC motion. This is democracy in our party. We must fight a united message. We are a united party. Vote for these. Don't delay conference. Let's get on with policy debate and support the CAC motion. Hello conference, um, my name is Lee Drennan, I'm a first time delegate, first time speaker, also chair of North West Young Labour and North West representative on the Young Labour National Committee. Conference, putting through rule changes, is, 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 it's, it's very important to us. We shouldn't have to take the bad with the good. We should support the, the Transport and Salary Staff Association motion to go forward. Devolution is a good thing. I'm from the North West. We have our own history, our own um, dialect. We, we, you know, we're, our, we're our own people as well. But I shouldn't have to um, support what is essentially a stitch up of the NEC to get this what we need. <laughs> Conference. If the NEC, you know, it disenfranchises. BAME members in Wales and Scotland because we're just going to have the leader appoint themselves to it. We should have members representing, uh, uh, we should, all members should be able to put themselves forward to, to represent their nation. It's common sense. Conference. 
I move that we put this to a card vote. Let's put it to bed. It's clearly a contentious issue. We've just had a damaging leadership election. Let's put it to bed and put it to a card vote and, end the, and seal the deal. Thank you very much, conference. David Flack, Rayleigh and Wickford, CLP. Uh, first time here since 1997, appalled at the lack of democracy and the gerrymandering that's gone on in our party. <laughs> Comrades, I am a militant. I am a militant de Democrat. I believe every one of you should have a vote on every one of these rule changes. <laughs> Not be bamboozled into... into slipping through a few things that uh, outgoing members of the NEC would like to put in place to make a, make a difference to outgrowing democracy. This party is a democratic party. This party should make its rules at its conference, one by one, and vote on each one of them. Anything less is not democratic, is not right, and I urge you to support reference back. <laughs> Martin Tolman, Meriden, CLP. The question I think we all need to ask ourselves is, do we want to unite this party? Yes. How do we do that? When people walk out from this room this morning, they need to feel confident that they've been able to debate and express their views on a range of different issues and that we come to a democratic decision on each of those. I said yesterday very briefly, I think it applies to policy as well. Rules and policy go hand in hand and what this party can no longer afford to have is a take it or leave it approach where people don't feel they've been able to be properly listened to. I certainly support this reference back. Morning conference. Jennifer James, Garston, first time delegates, first time speaker. Thank you. Um, I support the reference back and the card vote for one simple reason, and that is yesterday we, we voted with a show of hands. The chair thought that the motion was carried. Some of us thought it was 50-50, maybe the other way, but... We have speeches, we have awards, we pat ourselves on the back and that's all marvellous. But if there's one thing that is it worth taking time over, it is democracy. Have a card vote. Hi, my name is Mariana Masters. I'm from Stratton, London. First time delegate, first time speaker. Um, I'd like to express my support for the CAC committee and the report they've put together. We elect them. We ask them to prepare, and they have. Uh, they ensure the smooth running of conference. Having set out the report, I believe that we should now let the debate begin. We go over and over the report, um, and this prevents us actually doing what we're here to do, which is about deciding the real business of how we take the fight to the Tories. Let's not constantly look inwards whilst the Tories are getting on in power, making bad decision after bad decision. Yeah. 
Yes, we've had a summer of infighting, but the public are now looking. They're watching us. They're watching to see if we're serious. They're watching to see if we can come together. Most importantly, they're watching to see if we care about the issues as much as our issues. Let's show the country that we are united, we're professional, and yes, we've had our agreements, but let's go forward and show that more unites us than divides us. We have the CAC, an elected organisation, to, to help us organise and be ready to be the party of government. Thank you. Steve Walker, Garson and Halewood, also a first time delegate. <laughs> Don't clap too loud, some of you might not be clapping in a minute. Um, I've heard a few people shouting which part of this is the part that people are considered anti democratic. It's on page 21.h, which, frankly, adding nominated members rather than elected members to the NEC is uh, an anti democratic attempt by an NEC that's composed, <laughs> an NEC that's composed of a number of people significant number of people who have been voted out and believing at the end of this week to try to rig the deck afterwards. There's been, there's been things carried on the show of hands, I've heard people shouting, this has already been voted on, you know, the first vote, second vote, have been called clearly carried, I've been watching the floor, I don't think they were. I think it was very evenly split and, you know, it, it deserves, this is a matter, people say, let's, this, you know, we need to talk about how we take the fight to the Tories, I'll tell you what, if this gets through, this will decide in a negative way how we take the fight to the Tories because it will be against the democratic will of the vast majority of the members of this party. <laughs> Councillor Matthew Brown, Chair of Cleethorpe CLP. Ladies and gentlemen, we face an unprecedented challenge in taking the fight to the Conservative Party due to the tremendous amount of cuts and the damages that they are doing to our local community. By taking time up, going by this line by line, is damaging our ability to put forward policies that are progressive to our community. We elect members to the NEC, to the CLC, to represent all our views. We have a duty to support them because if we undermine them, that is anti-democratic. So I will be supporting the recommendations as laid out. This is the last speaker. Applause before I've even said a word. I will be brief, I promise you. You know, every morning I've sat here and we've gone through internal constitutional debates that are about, you know, internal politics, not about our view of the world. Conference, we have a full agenda on policy, but let me say this to you, and I hope to speak in the debate. Let's move away from process onto the politics of this. But I tell you this, that if we put internal politics ahead of the interests of the people of Scotland and Wales. We will pay a price for it. Conference, can I now ask Harry Donaldson to reply to the points that's been raised? Harry, good luck. <laughs> Thanks, Paddy. Um, conference, we've listened very intently to the comments that's been made by every delegate that came to the rostrum. We know these are important issues. Single vote on NEC rule changes. This issue of rule changes has been dealt with both on Sunday and yesterday, with CAC1, which was agreed on Sunday. 
The NEC provides recommendations for rule changes, and these are detailed in page 12. There is an opportunity to debate the rule changes. The NEC rule changes result from a broadening the consultation by the NEC and as such can be debated. In terms of the specific issues that were raised with regards to the first speaker in terms of the elephant in the room, in terms this hasn't been put to the CAC, therefore it's not contained within the report. In terms of clarification on the NEC rule amendments, these are a single a package of rule changes as detailed in CAC 1 and will be taken by one single vote as was agreed by conference on Sunday. With regards to the TSSA motion, the issue there in terms of an emergency was emergency motion closed at 12 on Friday. The TSA, TSSA motion was received yesterday. However, that being said, it was considered by the CAC and as such the detail of that was thought to be organisational on the basis of that was referred to the NEC who I'm sure will deal with these issues going forward. Thank you. Co yeah, please colleagues, um, we're trying to get through the conference business in a respectful way. People's got difference of opinions, that's fine. But that's not to disrupt the conference. <laughs> Harry, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, colleagues, CA, can I see all those in favour of accepting the report? <laughs> Co colleagues, colleagues, if you, in terms, uh, quiet please. If you want a reference back, you can vote against. All right. So, all those in favour, all those in favour. Thank you. Right, Christine. Sorry, several people said, including the mover, that they wanted a card vote on the reference back. Right. Christine, please, please, just delegates ask for card votes, then there will be a card vote, and I move that we immediately move to the card vote now. No, no, no. Co colleagues, colleagues, is to take a show of hands to see. To, no, let, please behave yourself. We're taking a show of hands to see if we have to go to a card vote, it'll take over an hour. And if we get the majority in a show of hands, then we don't need to go to the card vote. So, I'm si listen, listen, we're going to go to a card, we're, we're going to go to a show of hands. Can I see all those in favour of accepting the report? Thank you. All those against? That's overwhelmingly carried. Conference, uh, there are two statements by the National Executive Committee which are ca contained in CAC. Take your point of order. Order, please. Chair, conference. Look, I very clearly called for a card vote. The rules of our party says that when you move a reference back and you call for a card vote, a card vote will be taken. That's what the rules say. Uh, thank you, Manuel. Look, let, let me be clear. The reason, the reason for taking a card vote is if there's uh, a close, it looks like it's close. It wasn't close. <laughs> moving, moving next business. Um, conference, there are two statements by the National Executive Committee which are contained in CAC Report 3. One is a statement on what Labour stands for. The other is a statement on international trade. The NEC recommends that conference adopt these statements 
I will now formally move them, and they will be voted on at the end of the session. Is that agreed? Thank you. Conference moving now to the financial report conference. We now want to consider the financial reports which are contained on pages 48 to 78 of the National Executive Committee annual report. And I invite the party treasurer, Diane Holland, to present her report. Diane. Good morning, conference. I'm very pleased to present this year's Treasurer's Report. It had quite a build-up with that debate. It's been a great honour to serve as your Treasurer for the past six years, and I want to begin by thanking you most sincerely for the confidence you've placed in me and for re-electing me this year with support from constituencies, socialist societies and trade unions across the party. Thank you. A number of years ago, I began my report by adapting the Monty Python accountant sketch. I am the Labour Party treasurer and consequently too boring to be of interest. It's still true and it's a good thing. A treasurer's report is one of those things that you just don't want to be too exciting. However, this year I hope you're sitting comfortably because the report is, I am very pleased to say, interesting and exciting. It's something we've worked so hard for in recent years. Nine years ago, we had a debt of almost £25 million. And this year, I'm able to report the party is totally debt free. Now, our task is hard it's to continue rebuilding the finances of our party. And this year, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that we've achieved a surplus of five million pounds. I want to thank everyone who's played a part, and that is everyone, but particularly including the General Secretary Ian McNichol and the Executive Finance Director Simon Mills and the whole finance team because this just hasn't happened by accident. The finance strategy agreed by the NEC, approved by conference, stuck to rigidly by the business board, implemented throughout the party over the last nine years, has worked. Every year, we've repaid part of the legacy debt, we've funded running the party, and we've reassured anyone who donated to campaign funds that it would be used for just that, campaigning. There has been no expenditure until the funds are there. Sounds obvious, but you can't take it for granted. And no expenditure until it's been assessed to assure it meets our priorities. Maximizing our income, managing our costs, delivering our priorities. We have stuck to that finance strategy, including during the 2015 general election. So now we're debt free, what will change? The answer is one word, nothing. Everything we do will continue to be measured against those key tests we have learned from our history. So to continue the Monty Python theme, as a person, I always look on the bright side of life. But as your party treasurer, I have to plan for the worst. And this past year, we were threatened with worse than the worst. The vindictive anti-union, anti-Labour party, anti-democracy, anti-civil rights trade union bill, a shameful piece of Tory legislation which included clauses directly attacking the very existence of the Labour Party's finances for good. Also backed up by a threatened huge cut to the money which supports opposition parties in Parliament, the so-called short money. However, we saw off some of the worst excesses of these attacks Thanks to wonderful campaigning, we did what we do best. All parts of our party uniting together with the trade union movement and with a huge alliance of organisations and individuals. But let me single out for particular praise for the, in Parliament and in the House of Lords. Angela Smith and Labour's team in the House of Lords and Chris Bryant and Rosie Winterton in the House of Commons for all they achieved. Thank you. 
But I have to tell you, there remains a long-term threat to party finances in the clauses left in the Trade Union Act. And I can assure you we know we will need to continue to be vigilant. But conference, there is good news too. With many donations coming into our party, I want to thank all who have given funds, large and small, to the work of our party. Thank you to the trade unions for your magnificent support. Thank you to members of the Thousand Club and high value donors for your support too. And there's more. When I first did for, your, for election as your treasurer, I said I wanted to learn from Barack Obama's presidential campaign, raising small amounts of money from lots of people. This year, we can report success on that front too. More people than ever before donating to our party. During the gen general election, digital fundraising in particular generated major election campaign funds from thousands of members and supporters. Thank you to every single one of you. And the increased party funds I reported earlier have come from the huge surge in the number of people joining our party. <laughs> following last year's general election result, more following the election of Jeremy Corbyn as party leader, and there's continued growth too. <laughs> Labour Party membership at the end of 2015 was twice the number at the start. We are now the biggest party in the European Union and we are still growing. That is why we are cautiously beginning to be able to spend on investment and building a stronger party. Digital communication is vital to our future. So we're investing, as you've heard earlier, in digital developments to engage more with our growing membership. We will be offering bursaries to support black and ethnic minority, working class and disabled candidates. And in honour of Joe Cox MP, whose life so, was so tragically cut short, we are setting up the Joe Cox MP Memorial Fund for Women in Leadership. And for the first time in generations, we can build up what in the old days was called a war chest. Today, let's call it a Labour campaign trust fund for the general election. Conference, the finances of our party are secure and growing. So is our membership. But we don't just want to raise money for the, its own sake. We do it to build membership, to run campaigns, to win power in elections, so that we can change people's lives for the better. And the truth is, we can't do any of these things without the resources to back it up. So I want to assure you, I will continue as your treasure, treasurer. <laughs> to, prote <laughs> to protect and build the finances of our party so that we can deliver a better life for our people and for our country too. Thank you. That, Diana, a huge thank you to you, Ian, Simon, and the whole team for what is a, a fantastic position that the party currently finds itself in. Colleagues, would anyone like to ask any questions or make any points arising, arising from Diana's report? We're looking for brief remarks rather than speeches. Um, okay, two colleagues there and a colleague there. Thank you, Chair. Uh, point of order conference. In the uh, CAC report on page 7, uh, it says, in addition to, uh, to, uh, to the above ballots, votes, votes at conference are taken as a show of hands unless a card vote is requested by delegates or at the decision of the Chair. Chair, we should have had a card vote. And I move we go to a card vote still. <laughs> Conference was dealt with the with the financial report. Oh, morning conference. <laughs> Important bit out of the way first. I've got to wave to my grandchildren and great grandchildren. 
So I'm trying to get them involved in politics while they're on the way to nursery. <laughs> conference, unfortunately, um, I'm nowhere near a first-time dele uh, delegate to conference, and not even a first-time speaker. I say that because over the years, many a time I've come into this whole tier of the Treasurer's report, many a time. It's actually quite pleasing because there's more in the hall today than probably the last 10 years put together. It's usually one of the quietest times of the day when the treasure get up. And I remember nine years ago, listening and walking out this hall saying, we haven't got a penny to fight the next general election. Christ, have we got enough for the next council elections? We really were in a desperately bad way. And I owe Diane a big apology because if, if six years, I believe, ago, I was in the hall when she was elected treasurer. And, and, I, and I remember clearly our first speech. And I thought, there's just no way she can deliver on that. And certainly not in the time scale. I wasn't expecting a debt-free uh, Labour Party in my lifetime because of the way we'd spent in, pre in previous years. So I really have to tell you, colleagues and members out there, this is just a phenomenal piece of work that's being done. I owe an apology <laughs> and a big vote of thanks to Diane and to you know, General Secretary and Simon, the whole team, to be standing there talking about a surplus. It's, it, it's just mind-boggling. And the fact that you've all gone out of your way to come here just to hear Diane speak <laughs> is a big boost. It's a big boost. I encourage you to keep the policies up you have. And, whilst, and remember, Diane was on target before the surge in membership. It was a tremendous piece of work before the surge in membership and the extra money. So while we're in surplus, I encourage you to keep this policy up. One piece, let's, can we buy our own headquarters as an investment in the future? And if you want to keep this policy up even more, buy it in a real good place with cheap council tax with cheap land, somewhere like Sunderland. <laughs> you know, maybe. You know, um, Sunderland in Tynham, will you? We'd gladly welcome you. It, uh, and I'm sure I don't have to speak for the Labour of the Council because I'm one of his councillors and he, he might have us in the office tomorrow, but I'm sure he would look forward to working with you and find you a piece of land. But really just more, more of what you're doing because on behalf of the membership, I'm taking a little liberty here, colleagues, but on behalf of the membership of the Labour Party, well done and thank you. Conference, George McManus, Beverly and Holderness and Rule Book Nerd. I, I really just want to give them, the, the chair some information. Cl and please bear with us just for 30 seconds. Clause 3 of our rule book, agreed over the last 100 years, outlines procedural rules for party conference. Part 3, Clause A makes it clear. Voting at party conference and resolutions, reports, amendments, proposals and references back shall be by show of hands or when the conditions laid down by the CAC require it by card. And therefore, we should have a card vote. Colleagues, we're dealing with a financial statement. Steve Beckett, Crew and Antwerp CLP, 40 years membership, but first time delegate. I am speaking on finance and I'm asking a question. Congratulating Diana and the team on a £5 million surplus. My question is, and I don't expect it to be answered now, but it's a request for this to be sent to all CLPs and affiliated organisations through a newsletter. My question is, how much of that £5 million surplus has been donated by those people joining as registered supporters? And can we have the information of those registered supporters that were either suspended 
or that got lost. I've not got much time, comrades. All got lost in the electoral roll. Can we have that information about how much and how many those were? Thank you. Fine up, one more speaker. Right. Another final speaker, please. Uh, Carol Wilcox, Christchurch, CLP. Um, I'm really, um, I'm really happy to hear um, Diana's report. It's very encouraging. But I do worry how much we're going to be paying out in uh, court uh, court fees, because there is so much discontent of people being disenfranchised and being taken. You know, their money being taken, that's the problem. I think we're going to be involved in a lot of legislation. If that was the final speaker. Um, Diana, do you want to reply to the points? Thanks very much for the support. It's uh, really much appreciated uh, and some very positive comments. I think just on the first contribution, one small point that Simon mentioned to me is you may not be aware, but currently the finance team is in fact based in Newcastle and they may not want to move to Sunderland. <laughs> um, the second question, obviously a more serious response, um, was just to say that, in fact, the report is on 2015 expenditure. So, in responding to the question, obviously that will come in 2016 report. So, um, but in terms of ensuring that this information gets out there, we've got that message and we'll pass it on. The question you've raised will be considered at the business board during this year and we'll make sure that it's included. Um, on the third point, um, yes, of course, we are always, as a party, having to ensure that we have sufficient funds to cover some of the legal challenges that we face or that we want to take to protect ourselves. It is something which we have to have a, an element of our budget for. So, of course, as a business board and certainly as an NEC member, we try to do all we can to avoid legal costs, but sometimes they are unavoidable. We also have an audit risk committee and legal challenges is one of the issues that they are constantly keeping under review. And if they are concerned, they bring it to the business board's attention. But it is a really serious concern. It's the nature of politics at the moment. We have these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, Conference, we now need to formally to adopt the financial statements. Can I see all those in favour of doing so? And thank you. And all those against? Unanimous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Conference, we, we must now consider the rule amendments which have been put forward by the National Executive Committee. We also have six proposed rule changes which have been made by CLPs. The proposals are listed in Conference Arrangements Committee Report 1. I will now, sorry, Report 3. Uh, I will now ask Andy Kerr to move the rule changes on behalf of the National Executive Committee. Andy. Chair, uh, Conference, Andy Kerr on behalf of the National Executive Committee uh, to move uh, the rule changes. Conference, there are a number of road changes that have been proposed by CLPs and the NEC, uh, which will be subject to card votes uh, later today. I thought that might get a laugh. Uh, all of the proposed amendments are detailed in the CAC Report 3 and are, uh, and are 
ordered according to their position in the card votes. Uh, I thought they were going to be displayed uh, beside me, but obviously they're not. So I'll go through them. Are they there? Oh, they are. They are good. <laughs> Just follow that. You'll do OK. Uh, card vote one uh, is proposed by the NEC, and it is recommended that you vote for these changes. But let me just put the record straight on the basis of some of the comments earlier. These uh, are a package of changes were the result of party reform uh, discussions and consultations that have taken place throughout this year with a number uh, of people, uh, wide-ranging uh, discussions. So they, they haven't and weren't just drawn up by the NEC. They were a result of discussions and consultations that's taken place. And let me just put the record straight. At the NEC meeting a week past on Tuesday, all apart of one of these packages in the package of rule changes were carried unanimously. <laughs> all apart from one. And the one where there was controversy was the one uh, where it affected the makeup of the NEC. And obviously, uh, there was some discussion, as you would expect there to be, uh, on that. But there are a package. And this card vote is a package of amendments brought forward by the NEC, including a national annual women's conference with a formal role in the policy-making process. New, new support for councillors and policing crime commissioners and greater accountability for our new Metro mayors. We will also give rights, more rights, and greater responsibility to Scotland and Wales, strengthening our party by strengthening the bonds between us. Conference, as a party and as a country, we are truly better together. Over the last year, the NEC has been consulting on these changes to reflect the concerns of our local communities and to ensure that our party is totally focused on taking the fight to the Tories, the SNP and all of our opponents. Our councillors and local government representatives are the backbone of Labour and administration across the country. And we thank them all for their hard work. So, conference, we will increase uh, support for our councillors and do more to ensure uh, that uh, MPs, councillors, police and crime commissioners and mayors reflect the diversity and the communities they represent. But, colleagues, it is clear we need to do more to increase diversity in local government, including increasing the number of working class and underrepresented people, selecting, selecting more female candidates and promoting women in leadership roles across local government. <laughs> Conference, we need to do much more to encourage more women, BAME, working class, LGBT and disabled people to stand for elected office. <clears throat> there are some areas of the reform work which require further thought and reflection, and there are many more issues to consider in the coming months. But there are so many important areas where there is consensus, and we must, we must take action now. NEC will discuss in the next few weeks, uh, further discuss these issues in the next few, few weeks, and I'm not going to preempt the outcome of those discussions. But one thing I will say to you now. If, as a result of those discussions, there is a need for a special conference, well, we will have a special conference. In the spirit of unity, and I really mean this, brothers and sisters, in the spirit of unity, I ask you, please support this package of rule changes. <laughs> conference on the other uh, uh, rule amendments. Conference card vote two on Ash from Ashfield CLP seeks to give retired members uh, subsections or associations of trade unions the right to affiliate to CLPs at the discretion of the regional director or general secretary in agreement with the affiliated trade union. The NEC supports this amendment and recommends conference overwhelmingly carries uh, this rule change and votes for it. Card votes three to seven have been submitted by CLPs and the NEC asks that those uh, CLPs to remit uh, those rule changes, and, and if those CLPs decide not to remit the rule changes, these will be card votes uh, three to seven. Uh, the recommendation of the NEC would be to vote against these amendments. Card vote three concerns the priorities ballot. 
in 2015 and in this year, using the existing system for the priorities ballot, the CEC have tabled eight subjects for debate, four each from the CLPs and from affiliates. No overlap between topics. The CEC intends to continue this practice for future conferences. This proposal is therefore unnecessary and difficult to implement as it requires two ballots on the first day of conference and limits choice available to CLP delegates. If this is not remitted, it is recommended that conference votes against this change. Card vote four would permit CLPs and affiliates to submit both a constitutional amendment and a contemporary motion each year. If passed, conference would need to devote much more time to rule change debates, cutting down the available time for debates on policy matters and composites. It could also lead to an, uns an unstable uh, rule book, with multiple changes which become difficult to, for CLPs to implement. Conference, the NEC recommends voting against card vote four if the, CPLs, uh, if the CLP does not wish to remit. Card votes five and six uh, cut across the ongoing review of, policy, uh, commission, of the policy commission by Jeremy Corbyn and being overseen by the NEC. This review looks at all aspects of policy making, including the role of annual conference, and it would be wrong to preempt its conclusions. These rule changes would, would also fundamentally confuse the policy making process and the iterative uh, process for the NPF. Conference again, the NEC recommend voting against these rule changes. The final card vote, seven, refers to the election of CLP coordinators uh, to take on a particular area of responsibility. There is no need for this rule change as the current rules permit CLPs uh, to already appoint a small business liaison coordinator uh, if they so wish. The NEC uh, position for this rule change is also to recommend uh, against if it's not remitted. Thank you, Conference. Uh, thank you, Andy. We, we now have a number of rule changes which have been proposed by CLPs. The procedures will be that each will be moved by a delegate of the CLP concerned who has five minutes to speak. I will then ask for it to be seconded. If no delegates of the CLP move the rule change, then it falls. The first rule change is on the Trade Union Retired Members Branch affiliation and is to be moved by Ashfield. Is the Ashfield delegate here? Come on, okay. Second, uh, the second be uh, ready to move as well on the priorities ballot. Melanie Darrington, Ashfield CLP. Not that long ago, half a million men worked in the coal mines. Most of the men in my family were miners, as was most of the men on my street in Mansfield. And as a child, I'd look out of my window and just look at Clipston Colliery opposite, and that pit defined my community. And on my street, we didn't have a lot, but we had each other and we had our pride. But something happened, conference, and that something was Maggie. The pits were closed down, communities broken, but we still had our pride. And we knew, as we still know, that Nottinghamshire miners were never the enemy within. But it wasn't really Maggie. We know it doesn't matter who the Tory leader is be it Maggie, Cameron, or Theresa May. The Tories are always bad news for me, bad news for you, and bad news for our communities. And we must make sure we don't let our voters forget this. We need a Labour government at that next general election. But the truth is, comrades, 
There's nothing physically left. There's no minds left. There's no evidence that pits once stood where country parks and fancy apartments now stand. Our history is being eroded. Children can't empathise with our past. It's almost like the heavy industries have been written out of history. But the ex-miners of Ashfield want to keep these memories alive. Many have joined retired sections or associations to continue being part of a movement that cares about its fellow man. And these retired association members do not want to lose their ties with the Labour Party. They want to be actively involved as affiliated branches. They've worked tirelessly in Ashfield, knocking on doors and delivering their newsletters to former mining communities. And these ex-miners have a story to tell. And through them, affiliated to the Labour Party in their own right, their history, our history, and the Labour Party's history will live on. Conference, I urge you to support this rule change. Well, is, that, is that formally seconded? Formally seconded. Can we move to the next rule change that's on the priorities ballot and it's been moved by the CLP. Sarah Kerrison, Barry North, CLP, excuse me on this bit, moving rule change to Chapter 3, Clause 3, 2C, set out on page 4 of the Addendum to the Delegates Report and page 26, I think, if I've got this right, of the CAC report you received today. <laughs> it has been recommended that we remit this, however, the, it was submitted 18 months ago, and I think we should have a decision on it today. Each conference, CLPs and affiliated delegates vote on the priorities ballot. This year and last, eight items were selected for the agenda, but this has not always been the case. When union and CLP priorities overlapped, it has led in the past to six, seven, even five being listed. We want to ensure that four plus four equals eight. This is in the spirit of the original rule change. Conference is a time for delegates to have our say. And while we applaud the decision that has been made to move to the next on the list when priorities do overlap, it's not guaranteed this will always be the case. It's currently open to the interpretation of the CAC. As was said earlier, the CAC intends Intentions are great, but we would like a guarantee. Whoa. You may be concerned that time is a factor, and I can appreciate that. Affiliates vote on block, and this can be carried out in a relatively short time, leaving ample opportunity to, for delegates to vote on the amended ballot. The important thing for me is by knowing what has already been listed, we can use our votes in a more informed way we won't be voting for items already listed to be discussed. Our votes, which we can target more, we can focus more, they'll have more weight. As delegates, conference is a time to be heard, to listen, to make a different sort of contribution to the party that we all love and we all work for all year round. Please support this rule change and ensure that four plus four keeps equaling eight. Thank you. Thank you, colleague. Is that is, is that seconded? Does any of the other two uh, CLPs want to second? The ticket is formally seconded. Thank you. Uh, the next rule change is on the submission to conference and has to be moved by, well, by a CLP. There's quite a number. I feel Healy be ready for the fourth. Oh, you okay? A second thing what's happened down here. Hey, acrobats. <laughs> Thank you, conference. That's the only slip up today, hopefully. Um, 
Thank you, Conference. Um, Harry Clark, Mid Norfolk CLP, and a proud GMB member and Unison member. Conference, I've been a member of our party for over 40 years, uh, but I haven't been waiting that long to move this motion, despite my haste to move up to the platform. Conference, our rule change would allow CLPs and affiliates to submit both a rule change and a contemporary motion. Why are constituencies, union and socialist societies required to choose whether they want to make proposals to conference about how our party works or have a say in policy making, I don't think my CLP is unusual in wanting a view on the rule book and support rule changes to improve the democratic process and also take a view, for example, on grammar schools, housing, the NHS, protecting public services, to give a few examples. Why are these counterposed? Conference, it would be, in my view, ridiculous to suggest that this would open the floodgates because not everyone loves to read the rule book as much as I do. Uh, and not even every CLP and affiliate will take advantage of both opportunities. If they do, that's what a priorities ballot is for. We've had a fantastic increase in our membership. Let's not make our reinvigorated CLPs choose how they engage with conference. Should it be a rule change or contemporary motion? Let's be really radical and allow them to do both. Thank you, conference. I move. Can we have it seconded? Uh, Rachel Garnham, Mid Bedfordshire CLP. Conference Labour Party membership has doubled in the past year or so. CLPs like mine have been reinvigorated. Our new members want to get out on the doorstep locally, but they also want to put forward their views on policy and make constructive suggestions on how our party could work better. My CLP would have liked to put forward a contemporary motion. I had to explain to our new members and officers that unfortunately we couldn't because they had already submitted a rule change. They were baffled. Currently, there is an unnecessary and arbitrary restriction on submitting a rule change and a contemporary motion. It makes no sense that we can't do both. It is ludicrous to suggest that hundreds of CLPs and affiliates would be overcome by some constitutional fervor and the conference would be overrun by rule changes. We have the priorities ballot for contemporary issues. Something similar could, if really necessary, and we get really excited about the rule book, be instituted for rule changes. Andy said that this could make the rule book unstable. It seems to me that what makes the rule book unstable is being asked to vote to choose between a policy-making women's conference and an extra two unelected people on the NEC. If we're having... I don't think that having a few more rule changes from constituencies is going to, to have quite the same impact. Um, conference, this is a minor change that would make a great difference and allow CLPs, affiliates, trade unions, socialist societies to have a little bit more say in conference. Please support democracy, support more say for members and affiliates and vote for, card vote for. Thank you. Okay, uh, conference, the next rule change is on the rights to refer back part of the policy document and is moved by Sheffield Healy CLP. And can we ask Wimbledon CLP to be ready uh, for the next?
Jack Dunn, Sheffield Healy CLP, second time to conference, the first time was in 1981, and I can tell you there's been a few changes since then. <laughs> Comrades, brothers and sisters, the all or nothing approach to national policy is a nonsense. For too many years, this has been used to limit debate and has led to the adoption of otherwise unpopular policies. This in turn results in bad policy making. Currently, if the National Policy Forum produces an economy, economy paper, for example, it might include many proposals which delegates support, but others on which they have great concerns. Our only option is to accept or reject the whole paper. For example, in 2000, conference voted through a document which included excellent proposals, but it also included PFI. So the whole document went through. In 2004, we were presented with an excellent education document, but it also included tuition uh, fees. We weren't able to reject tuition fees for the fear that we would lose student grants and local education maintenance allowance and investment in Shore Start. So we passed the whole document, including tuition fees. Conference, this must change. We wouldn't accept this in our Labour Party branches, or in our CLPs, or in our union branches, or any other organisation that we're involved with. So why accept it at national policy level? For too long, the debate... For too long, the debate at conference has been, has been stifled by this rule. The result has been bad policy. Our rules should encourage debate our decisions should generate good policy. Please reject this insidious and debilitating rule change. Conference, I move. Thank you. The conference cannot be formally seconded. Formally. Okay, thank you. The next rule change is on submissions to conference contemporary motions, and it's been moved by Wimbledon CLP. Wimbledon CLP in the room? No. Okay, we'll move to the next one to give them a chance to turn up. Uh, the next rule change is um, rules on CLPs, additional officer, and it's to be moved by Airwise CLP. Are they in the room? Is there an indication that the CLP is here? No. Just, no. Okay, colleagues, if, if either of the two LCP, CLPs don't turn up by the end of the debate, then both will fall. Okay, colleagues, we're going to now move to uh, speakers on these rule changes, so could you indicate those who want to speak? Okay, just give me a time. Uh, take the, the one with the red, yeah, the red folder. Um, the lady with the white, yeah, shawl. And the lady in the green, yeah. Think of it, I'll come back around again. Conference. Mike Katz, Jewish Labour Movement, speaking actually on our, the, our rule change and the rule change in the name of other CLPs in Appendix 1 that was circulated earlier. And this is a rule change about rooting out racism and anti Semitism from our party. <laughs> Conference. I don't want 
to be here because I wish there hadn't been an upsurge in anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, misogynistic and homophobic vile hate speech in our party. Even conference here in our exhibitions and on our fringe, I'm sad to report. Jeremy has said it. Tom has said it. We have all said it. There is no place for this in our party. We must root it out. Against this backdrop, is it any wonder, conference, any wonder, that support for Labour amongst British Jews is said to be as low as 7%? Conference, it makes me weep. The party of Manny Shinwell, the party that has done more than any other to promote tolerance and equality, the party to which the Jewish Labour movement has been affiliated since 1920 is not seen as a welcoming home for Jews. The leadership has acted, and we welcome that. They set up the Royal Report, they set up the Chakrabarti Report, which had a number of good rule changes which would help our party deal with the problem. So I have to say, conference, we are beyond disappointed, we're dismayed that the NEC didn't put this forward in their package of rule changes so that we could sort this now. Andy moving it said we have to take these rules uh, for, because they require urgent action and conference. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But leaving it as passing our rule change for debate next year means waiting another year so we can actually put this rule change on our books. It means another year to change our rules to make racist and anti-Semitic and other abuse as grave an offence as supporting another political party. Another year to send the signal to our members, to our minority communities, to the whole country that we are serious about dealing with this problem. Conference, we shouldn't have to wait a year. We shouldn't have to wait a further minute. We should have been able to do it now. They had our words, they had Chakrabarti's words, and they could have put them into effect immediately. So conference, I have to say, and I say this with no little regret, the JLM does feel let down, but we're going nowhere. We're going to be working with our members. We're going to be working with our members, with our affiliated members, with supporters, MPs, councillors, in CLPs, in affiliates, to show that, like every minority community, Jews are welcome in the Labour Party. Yeah. And conference. Conference, thank you for that. That means a lot, not to us, but to the whole Jewish community. And I will say one more thing before we go. Before I go. If we have to wait a year, sadly, so be it. But the next best thing we must do is renew our commitment to dealing with this. Show we're serious in dealing with anti-Semitism, racism, misogyny, homophobia. And it's up to all of us, from the very top of this party downwards, to make, take responsibility for calling out hate speech in our party whenever we see it. Thank you, conference. Have the next speaker, please. Uh, thank you, Mike, for me having to follow that on a similar subject. Um, Kath McGurk, Finch and Golders Green, accounts in the London Borough of Barnet for 22 years. Finch and Golders Green has the largest consti Jewish constituent base in the country. And this is an issue not just for the party, but for the people out there. The review undertaken by Shama Chakrabarti this summer on anti-Semitism in our party, although criticised by some as a whitewash, did highlight that there are still issues that needed to be addressed. There were still concerns expressed within our party. This is not also just about anti-Semitism. On Saturday at the Women's Conference, 
I heard stories of discrimination, be it against disability, your sexuality, your race or your faith, and bullying because, on, because of your gender. We do need to make it clear that discrimination of any kind is unacceptable in our party, in our country and in the world at large. We need to show the way as our party, and we do need to do it now, not next year. Thank you. This is why my constituency, Finchley Gold is Green, along with the Jewish Labour movement and another eight constituencies, submitted constitutional amendments on this very subject. We were therefore exceedingly pleased when Jeremy Corbyn, when he attended a hustings in North London, publicly agreed that this would be taken at conference this year. Sadly, this does not seem to be the case. Comrades, I'm sure you agree with me that to show everyone that we, in the Labour movement, totally oppose any discrimination, bullying, homophobia and misogyny, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Last this year, we saw that for the first time, a Muslim elected as mayor as a major city in Europe. <laughs> he faced attacks from the Tories and the Tory press, something even me, me, who's been a member for 34 years and a council for 22 years, have never seen the like of. We as a party joined forces and fought that, electing him with a huge mandate, the biggest mandate in Europe. We absolutely must oppose bigotry and discrimination. We need to act without delay. The rhetoric is fine. I urge a rethink now. Actions speak louder than words. We must move now. Thank you, comrades. Conference before the next speaker. Before, no, come on up, okay. Before the next speaker, I can get three more in because we're way behind. Um, I'll try this side of the room this time. Um, <clears throat> the lad there, yeah, the red, the red, yep. Uh, lady over the pink folder. And the lady over the red. Sorry, well, there's three. Yep, you. Okay, colleague. Okay. Conference, Jackie Bailey, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Dumbarton. Thank you. <laughs> Here today to, to take a risk and invite you all to come to Scottish Conference in February, but I do so as a thank you for what I hope you are about to do, because today you have an opportunity to help us, to bring to an end a decade-long debate over Scotland's place in the Labour Party, an opportunity to close the door on our opponents who make the accusation that Scottish Labour cannot speak for Scotland, an opportunity to help us write a new chapter as we build our party to be an electoral force in the future. You know, it is that important, so please don't squander that opportunity. Because the reforms we're voting on today aren't just technical changes, they are fundamental to the future of the party in Scotland. And you know, whilst Labour was the party of devolution, radically reforming the way the country was run, we didn't match that with devolution in the party itself. And today, we need to change that. Because our politics is not the politics of the Westminster bubble. We have been proud as a Labour government to devolve power to Scotland and to Wales in strong parliaments and assemblies, and it's time to do that for the party too. So the proposals before you today haven't just arrived yesterday, they've come about after discussion between Kez and Jeremy, a year-long conversation between the SEC and the NEC, and extensive consultation with members and trade unions too. This is what our members and affiliates want. It's been our aspiration for more than a decade. So let me turn to the point of contention, representation on the NEC. Our UK leader was, result, was elected with 71, 61%, I'm getting this wrong. Our UK leader was elected with 61% of the vote. Our Scottish leader was elected with 72% of the vote. Nobody, nobody is questioning Jeremy Corbyn's absolute right to be on the NEC. We are a devolved party. The Scottish leader should be there too, 
as should the Welsh leader. And finally, conference, let, 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 me, let me just tell you, I've got a postcard on my wall in the Scottish Parliament, and it says, Labour women make policy, not tea. That postcard's quite old. Today, you have an opportunity to make sure that Labour Women's Conference absolutely makes policy and not tea. So today, I ask you to vote for women, to vote for bursaries, for working class candidates, for ethnic minorities, and for disabled. And you know what? Vote for Scotland and Wales too. <laughs> Next delegate. Hey, conference. Uh, Tom Honeywell from Wirral West. I'm speaking in favour of the NEC's proposed rule changes because Labour voters and the country need a Labour government and to get a Labour government we need Labour in Scotland and in Wales. And if we don't start showing that we care about Scotland and Wales, we will never win in Scotland again and we will soon lose Wales. So conference, I'll keep this short and sweet. If we turn our back on them, they will turn their backs on us forever. Thank you. Fiona Dreiber at East Co-Bride CLP and I do see a theme developing here. Um, you know, this is my first time at conference, the first time delegate, first time speaker obviously. Um, but I am passionate about Scottish Labour. I am speaking today on behalf to, to support the NEC uh, rule changes package. Scottish Labour has been so through so very much in the last few years. We have a leader in Keza who set out our agenda and a positive future in the debate yesterday. And you, the conference, gave her a resounding endorsement. Now give her the tools to deliver. Um, I and many others have campaigned tirelessly for the Labour Party. And we have been battered and we have been down, but we are certainly not out. We are fighters, but Scotland cannot be seen as a branch office. We deserve autonomy. We need to take the fight to the Tories and the SNP in Scotland. We must do this as Scottish Labour autonomous and united with the Labour Party, the Labour Party that I'm proud to be a member of. If the NEC, um, if we, sorry, are ever to see a Labour government, we need to win back our support in Scotland. Um, and if this proposal is not back just because of some people playing political games, then we are just, um, we are just going to be handing a, a, a major prize to the Tories. That is what we will be doing. Please do not let this be on your conscience. We in Scotland, we are Scottish Labour and we are part of the Labour Party. Unity through autonomy. Conference, please vote for this rule change. Kira Hogan, Campbell and Peckham, first time delegate and first time speaker. <laughs> Conference, I want to keep it short. We've spent the summer looking inward and arguing amongst ourselves. The NEC and our hard working Labour staff have been under huge pressure all summer, including sitting through some challenging and extremely long meetings. Some of their decisions have split the NEC on a knife edge vote. But there has been an overwhelming majority to put this complete package to conference. In the hall yesterday, I listened to John McDonnell's call to arms. We need to be prepared for a general election as soon as possible. Jeremy's clarion call and the theme of this conference has been to find unity so we can move forward. 
Let's get started on this journey by voting for this unified package together. Then we can put the division behind us and better spend our time taking the fight to the Tories. Thank you. Hey, the, the conference, that, that was, can I just uh, come back to the uh, two CLPs that weren't here earlier? Wimbledon and Airwash, are they, are they in the room? Is Wimbledon in the room to move? No. Is, just shout if it's Wimbledon, no. Okay, that falls. Um, and Airwash, CLP, in the room, that falls. Can I now ask Andy Kerr to reply to the debate? Andy. Sorry, conference. We're, we're so far behind because of the debate earlier today. Andy. <coughs> Thank you. We hear you. Andy. Conference. Uh, Andy Kerr replying to the debate. I'll just make a few fairly quick points. Then we'll stand back on a minute. Have your point of order. Apologies to Andy because I know you were just doing your job and I didn't mean to disrupt you. But this party needs to have a debate and the platform of attempting to rig the discussion by not allowing those who oppose the rule changes to come up here and make the arguments because they know that they don't have responses to our arguments. And the package going forth will gerrymander the NEC and allow for the decision made at the weekend to be vetoed by parliamentarians who are not accountable to this movement. I think, okay, conference, I think we've just had a speech. So thank you for that colleague, Andy Kerr. <laughs> Thanks, Paddy. Uh, I'll just make a few quick, quick remarks, hopefully. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Colleagues, we, we are trying to make progress. We have a lot of business, a lot of policy. Housing's the next debate. We're trying to get people in to actually start talking about the main substance of the policies and strategies we're putting forward. Andy. Con Conference. In the spirit of unity. <laughs> I know people are getting hated in this debate, but please, conference, let's, let's go through. Ashfield, uh, there's not much to reply in Ashfield, only to uh, you heard what the comrade for Ashfield said about that. I actually overwhelmingly to support that motion. Let's ensure that the NUM affiliation is still in this party, both at a national and a local level. Berry North, Sarah, uh, there's nothing between us in, uh, on the policy. We are agreed. The issue is uh, we have two. We have to have two um, ballots in the one day. And as I said, it has been in place now. Uh, that we have eight mo uh, uh, debates, contemporary motions, debated at this conference. That will continue. There's a process in place. Uh, it works. It works well now for two years. It will, it will work uh, uh, well for a long while to come, and there's no need to, to move this uh, uh, motion. I actually vote against. Harry uh, from Mid Norfolk. Um, the issue, and, and Harry, is, I'll just reiterate what I said before. If we have it, I accept that not every constituency will put in a rule change and put in a, a motion for debate. I accept that. Of course, that's the case. But whatever happens, there would be more rules uh, being debated. And we have to stop this looking inward and start looking outwards. It is a matter of either you have more time for rules or more time for policy. I ask you to support the policy. Uh, and we will review it in our processes going forward. Jack uh, from Sheffield Healy. You know, we've had this debate many times before, Jack. There is an on, ongoing review uh, on policy making. We did, I did say it's been commissioned by our leader, Jeremy Corbyn, and the NEC. There is an ongoing review about how policy is formed. I'd ask you not to support this, uh, this rule change at this time, but we will be taking everything into consideration during our review. On the, the issue Mike raised, um, on the Chakrabati report, can I just say that we will implement those recommendations. We have adopted the Code of Conduct. We signed that off uh, last week. We will be working on it. 
Uh, there is more discussion that needs to take place uh, on rule changes, but I want to make it clear on behalf of the NEC, discrimination of any kind is not acceptable in this party. Not acceptable. <laughs> and I will make one more point. Not only is it not acceptable, we need to challenge it ourselves. If it happens and we see it, we should challenge it. Ja Jackie, Tom, Fiona, uh, uh, Sarah, uh, uh, certainly Tom, Jackie and Fiona were sort of saying the same thing uh, about members and affiliates in Scotland. They were consulted, we did consult with Wales and in Scotland, uh, both myself, uh, Kath was dealing with Wales, uh, Joanna uh, Baxter was involved too. We, were, we did talk to affiliates in both Wales and Scotland. We did talk to members in both Wales and Scotland. We did talk to the Welsh uh, executive, the Scottish executive. This was a matter for long debate. Uh, it is in place. I ask you, for this and for no other reason, we cannot go back in this one. We have gave a commitment to both Scotland and Wales on this. We must support this one. The other issues that's causing uh, of the makeup of the NEC, I can assure you, we will deal with it. We will deal with it in the, few, in the next few months. Conference, I've gave you, I'd ask you to support the NEC's recommendations, and I really mean this. In the spirit of unity, let's work together in, on this. I ask you to support the NEC recommendations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy. Um, the votes will be taken at the end of this session. Um, I now hand over the chair to Shabana Mahmood. Thanks very much, uh, Paddy. Uh, conference. We will now take the contemporary composite on housing to be moved by Gravesham CLP. And uh, could I also ask that South East Cornwall CLP uh, be ready to come up here and second? Thank you. Good morning, conference. I'm Tanmanjit Desi from Gravesham CLP in Kent, and I'm proud to be moving the composite motion on housing. I'm a first time speaker, and, and thankfully, because our motion was chosen, I didn't have to jump around this year to get the chair's attention uh, or wear a, a multicolored turban, or better still, get out my inflatable parrot. Conference in Gravesham, which, by the way, until last year was a Labour council, we know full well the importance of council housing to our residents. In the battle against homelessness, high rents, evictions and insecurity. That is why we fought tooth and nail not merely to preserve our housing stock, but to build even more council housing. And with the much talked about Ebbs Fleet Garden City on our doorstep, we want our residents to benefit while shielding those most in need of decent and affordable housing from the harshness of the Tories' Housing and Planning Act. But it's an issue that doesn't just affect us in Gravesham. It would be remiss of me, Chair, to not mention the fact that many colleagues worked late into the night to thrash out and agree this motion namely from South East Cornwall, Kensington, Isle of Wight, Islington North, Epsom and Yule, Forest of Dean, Guildford, Horsham, Rygate, Rochford and South End East, South Thanet and Southport. I am indebted to all of them. And I think this long list just shows how passionately many of us feel from different parts of our country because we realise the devastating impact it's going to have on our communities, especially those that most need the stability of secure social housing. People need and deserve decent, affordable housing. 
Actually, conference, there is a huge difference between the Tory so-called affordable housing, costing hundreds of thousands of pounds, and council housing. We as Labour need to build council housing. And in this regard, I want to congratulate my South East colleagues, Labour-run Milton Keynes Council, which is embarking upon the biggest council house building program outside of London. They are showing what Labour in power can deliver. Indeed, in the run-up to the important May Council elections, the message that we need to take out to our communities is that even under a mean Tory government, if you have a Labour council and elect Labour councillors, then they will fight for your interests, for the rights of you and your children to provide the services you most need. The previous Tory-led government brought in the deplorable bedroom tax, which didn't even spare the most vulnerable in our society. I had people coming up to me as a parliamentary candidate in tears because they were trying to explain the crushing impact it was having on their lives. And now the Tories are trying to bring in and force upon us a tenant tax. And we as Labour need to fight against that. That is why, Conference, I humbly urge you to support this motion. I move. Hello, Susan Shand, South East Cornwall CLP, first time speaking, first conference. And I'm here to second the Composite 9 on housing. Delegates, there are over 29,000 people on the housing register in Cornwall. That's not 29,000 single people, that's 29,000 applicants for families, many of whom are disabled or have a disabled member in their family because you don't get on the list unless you do these days. In my own town of Liscard, there are 350 families on the urgent housing need register. The Conservatives have completely failed to do anything for these people. In fact, their policies have done the exact opposite. They have made the situation a million times worse. The reason for this is that they are not, their housing policy is not about housing people. It's about creating mortgages. And their housing policies show this with the right to buy and the um, tax breaks for uh, landlords and for second homeowners. In Cornwall, second homeowners have pushed up the prices of houses to an extent where local people can no longer afford to buy in the areas in which they were born. Someone on an average 22,000 pounds a year in Cornwall will need 11 to 13 times their salary in order to buy a house, especially if they lived in one of the pretty villages where people like to go for their holidays, which die over the winter time because they are 45% holiday let, second homes, holiday homes. The conservative policies are destroying those communities and forcing local families inland into what's left of the council houses, which are unsaleable, unmortgageable, and in a lot of cases, uninhabitable. Or they're throwing them on the uh, mercy of private landlords who 
are in receipt of housing benefits in large figures. Uh, uh, on three months um, long leases. So you could be in somewhere for three months with your children at school and then you could be somewhere else, 10 miles away in a village on the edge of Bodmin Moor, 10 miles away from the nearest doctor, the nearest schools, the nearest libraries. The ne um, Delegate, can I ask you to wind up? Sorry, the nearest post office. Delegates, access to good quality home at a affordable price is a basic human need and the Labour Party should have a joined up policy to help people be housed adequately. Delegates, I ask you to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can now take um, some speakers on this motion. Can I just get an indication of all those who wish to speak? Um, it's a lady in the uh, stripy uh, top, um, gentleman in the red shirt. I'm going to take those two to start with. Um, no pressure or anything, but if you're both very, very quick, I think I might be able to squeeze somebody else in. We're running very short on time. Chair, Conference, Carol Saul, Unison. It is clear that across the UK there is a housing crisis which is worsening day by day. Adults of all ages and families of all sizes across the country are struggling to find a decent and affordable home to live in. Conference rents are rising, house prices are rising, sadly house ownership levels are falling. Yet fewer social and affordable homes are being built at a time when this is desperately needed. Yet fewer, fewer social and affordable housing is being built, sorry. More and more Unison members providing essential public services are forced to commute long distances because of the high cost of living. Many more are suffering high rents in substandard private renting. Young adults are staying at home longer with their parents because they cannot afford to live independently. And when young adults do find housing, this is likely to be in the substandard private rented sector due to the lack of social housing and finance for home ownership. Those who are lucky enough to find a decent home are often that of high rent swallows up their hard earned income with little left over for basic living cost. The housing crisis is rising day by day and blighting the experience of many, especially the low paid and the vulnerable. A key solution to the housing crisis is to build more social and affordable homes at prices ordinary citizens can afford. Unison is in favour of this. Housing campaigners are in favour of this. The Labour Party is in favour of this. Politicians across the political spectrum are in favour of this, and even some ministers in favour of this. That is why Unison will continue to campaign for more housing that is affordable for our members and the wider society. Housing policy has always been central to the Labour Party, and when it gets it right, it wins popular support. Labour needs to grasp the opportunity and get on the front foot of housing, developing credible, credible policies that appeal across the country. Let's see the Labour Party focus completely on winning power. It's no good being in opposition. Unison members need a Labour Party. Let's make it happen. David Hamblin, GMB delegate via the GMB Equality Conference, speaking in support of Composite 9 housing. I've long maintained that politics is about the food in your mouth and the roof over your head. If there isn't even that, then our politics must resolve the issue. The selling off of council houses, the uncertainty of work, low pay and more have all contributed to a rise in those without homes and those in precarious accommodation. 
The fact of the matter is that there is no way of dealing with the problem of rented houses in modern society except by public ownership. So spoke the illustrious Nye Bevan. We in La the Labour Party recognise that collective issues require collective resolutions and cannot be left solely to the private sector. As chair of the GMB Young Members Network, it would be remiss of me not to highlight the debilitating destruction that the lack of affordable housing wreaks upon youth. All too often, it falls on local authorities to provide support. Local authorities who are themselves under the sustained economic cosh of austerity and may not have the capacity to assist. I took the liberty of quoting Anarin Bevan at the start of this speech. It is not quite the indulgence it may first seem to be, though I do live in Cardiff North. As Minister for Health, Bevan is rightly lauded for his role in establishing the NHS, but housing also fell within his remit. It doesn't seem to have dawned upon some of people in this country that the vast majority of us cannot afford to buy a house. Over half a century on, we find ourselves in the same position. Unless we adopt this motion and make sure that it is a central piece of Labour Party policy, we will find ourselves in the same situation in another 50 years, where t hundreds and thousands of people are unable to have homes. We are called idealists when we condemn the plight of homelessness. We are accused of being idealists when we stand up for young workers seeking accommodation. And we are decried thrice more as idealists for having the temerity to advocate socialist policies which will address the malaise of a vindictive economic system in which we find ourselves. <laughs> Yet the Labour Party was founded on such idealism. I was proud to stand at this rostrum in 2015 where I professed an article of faith. Socialism is that curious distaste for the suffering of others and the resolve with which to change it. My brothers and sisters, the Labour Party must be that resolve made manifest. The Labour Party will build houses. The Labour Party will create jobs. The Labour Party will create unionised jobs. The Labour Party will fashion a better society and the homes with which people can dwell within it. After all, conference, we are the builders. And like the great Nye Bevan before us, we, se we seek to build a society worthy of the name. Solidarity. And please support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And because both delegates um, didn't take their full time, we can squeeze in one, one more uh, speaker. Um, the gentleman with the uh, red thing in his lapel there. Yep. Conference, Frank McEvity, leader of Glasgow Labour Council, Scotland's largest city and the biggest Labour group in Scotland. I stand here today because housing made and shaped the Labour Party in Glasgow. From pioneers like Mary Barber, a Labour and cooperative councillor who fought the rent strikes and fought for the rent against the landlords 100 years ago, to John Wheatley, probably the best housing minister this country has ever seen. And we have an ambition. We have an ambition in Glasgow to make sure we continue the progress. Because in 1997, we had the highest rents, the largest debt, and the least satisfaction with our housing. It required a Labour government, a Labour government, to spend the issue of a billion debt being relieved. And the people of Glasgow to allow us to invest in our housing. And next year, when the SNP claim to take the mantle of Scottish Labour, next year when they will try and take a number of Labour authorities in Scotland, we must remind people the difference a Labour Council can make to everyone's life. And even this very moment, we are always concluding a deal to make sure that 2,000 workers in our city building will be guaranteed employment for the next 30 years in a unionised workplace, making sure they've got chances for themselves and their families. That is what Labour does in action. The SNP will talk about tackling inequality. We are about reducing the inequality gap. We are fundamentally committed to working with the people of Glasgow to transform our city. We're investing in housing. We're investing in education, we're investing in jobs, 
We're creating the opportunity to make sure people are looked after. We were the first council in Scotland to introduce the living wage. We were the first council in Scotland to say the trade union bill was unacceptable. And we were the first council in Scotland to say, when it came to the refugee crisis, not how many can we take, it was how many can you give us to make sure we can look after many of the most vulnerable. So we have a challenge, and I say to every delegate here today, we are passionate very often in the Labour Party about rule books. But let's be passionate about changing people, giving them the chance. So next year, our test is can we hold the largest city in Scotland? Can we roll back the nationalist advance? Can we make sure that the people of Glasgow have people who put them first and not the Constitution? If we can do that, we can make a difference. I ask it, each and every one of you to commit to that over the next period. And I would love to see you in Glasgow to make sure we can hold a Labour Council for the people of Glasgow to make a difference in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now start the debate on health and care. The uh, Policy Commission annual report is on pages 24 to 28 of the National Policy Forum report, and the Priorities Issues document is on pages 74 to 80. We will also be taking the contemporary composite on the NHS. I will now ask Joanna Baxter to move the Policy Commission annual report on behalf of the National Executive Committee. Care conference. A publicly owned healthcare system free at the point of need. That's Labour's creation and our greatest achievement. And after breaking my ankle in several places earlier this year, it's one I literally wouldn't be standing here without. The Tories are taking our NHS backwards and failing to protect our most precious institution. And their record is a shameful one. Record levels of deficits in hospital trusts, patients waiting for hours and hours to be seen, key targets being missed across the board, cuts to older people's care, delayed discharges from hospitals at record high, patients trapped on hospital wards with nowhere to go, and the worst a &E performance in a decade, and it's not even winter yet. So shame on you, Jeremy Hunt. Our mental health services have traditionally been seen as the Cinderella of the NHS. This government is failing to provide mental health services. Since 2010, we have lost nearly 5,000 mental health nurses. It is feared that the government's unfair decision to scrap NHS bursaries for nurses and allied health workers will have a negative impact on the numbers of mental health nurses compromising the future supply of our mental health nursing workforce. In 2011-12, investment in mental health fell by 150 million, the first fall in investment in a decade. And analysis shows that over the last parliament, funding for our mental health fell by 8% in real terms. And so that's why this year conference, our Health Commission's priority document focused on the issues of mental health. And I want to pay tribute to Luciana Berger for all of the work that she did when she served as our Shadow Minister for Mental Health. So our Policy Commission looked at some key issues. Parity of esteem between mental and physical health, importance of early intervention and prevention to help our mental health system move away from being one that only deals with issues once they have reached crisis point. And ensuring that mental health policies work for everybody in our society, recognising that mental health affects people of all ages and from all backgrounds and walks of life. The government should be doing much more on that vital issue and in so many other areas of our health service. And when leading Tories promised us 
£350 million a week, more investment for the NHS just a few short months ago. Their record is even more shameful than that. So I have to say, Boris Johnson, where is the investment for the NHS? Where is our £350 million a week investment for our health service? Shame on you. And the Tories have also made cuts to public health services, putting at risk preventative schemes such as screening, sexual health and smoking cessation. The government's delayed childhood obesity strategy, which was finally published this summer, is a missed opportunity and highlights the government's complete lack of commitment to solving the obesity crisis. Let's be very clear, conference. Patients are being let down by this Tory government. And so are NHS workers. The Tories are putting our future supply of nurses and health workers at risk by scrapping nurse bursaries. And Jeremy Hunt has failed to resolve the junior doctor's contract, which has led to junior doctors being forced to take industrial action just to have their voices heard. The Tories need to rebuild trust that they have lost with junior doctors and get back round the negotiating table to find a solution which puts in place a fair and safe contract. The simple fact is that the Tories have no answers to the challenges we face other than taking our country backwards. There's no plan to tackle the financial crisis facing the NHS and social care. Imposing a new contract on junior doctors and cutting NHS bursaries will risk making staff shortages in the NHS even worse. Staff shouldn't be punished for this government's financial mismanagement of the NHS. And cuts to public health will end up putting more pressure on the NHS as vital preventative services get slashed. So conference, it's our responsibility to protect the NHS. And we can only do that if we get back into government. So let this be the one thing that unites every single person in this hall and beyond. I move the report. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joanna. We will now take Contemporary Composite 7 on the NHS to be moved by Sutton and Cheam CLP. And could I also ask Westminster North CLP uh, to be ready and in place so that they can second? Hi, my name is Bonnie Craven. I'm the Secretary of Sutton and Cheam CLP, long-term activist, but this is my first conference. I'm moving Composite 7 on the NHS. 31 submissions were made on this motion, and I'm really honoured to be moving this incredibly important motion. Our NHS is probably the finest achievement of our movement, and yet it's in real danger of immediate, uh, real immediate danger of being destroyed. Former Tory Prime Minister John Major was born in our local NHS hospital, St Heliers. And yet under his government, we saw the introduction of private finance to our hospitals via the public-private partnerships. These and PFI leech money from our NHS and are partly responsible for bringing it to its knees in association with chronic and persistent underfunding. St Helier Hospital, the one that he was born in, it may now face closure along with Queen Mary's Children's Hospital on the same site. This Tory government is taking PFI even further. Conference, this motion commits us to ending PFI.
In 1988, Tory MP Oliver Letwin wrote a book called Privatising the World. This is widely regarded as the blueprint for the privatisation of our public services, including the NHS. The Health and Social Care Act 2012 removed the legal duty of the Secretary of State for Health to provide a comprehensive national health service. It also demanded contracting out in the NHS and the development of a marketplace. This has seen the administration costs rise from around 6% to about 15% of total NHS spend. Destruction of the NHS has continued apace under the Tory and Tory-led government since 2010. The unwanted, unhelpful, top-down reorganisation of our NHS, along with the further £22 billion of cuts by 2020, sees our National Health Service facing a real crisis. Right across the nation, our hospitals are under threat of closure. The so-called Sustainability and Transformation Plans, STPs, will be announced next month. These could see the number of England's hospitals slashed by more than half from 140 hospitals across England to between 70 and just 44. In my own part of South West London, we're facing the possible closure of our three nearest hospitals, placing intolerable pressure on the already overstretched St George's Hospital. But this is not unique to my area. These threats run right across the country from Cornwall to right here in Liverpool. In Britain, we already have fewer beds per 1,000 people than most other countries, even including Latvia and Greece. The awarding of NHS contracts to private providers such as Virgin Care must be stopped and reversed. Money spent on the NHS... <laughs> money spent on the NHS should be used to invest in it, not to line the pockets of the shareholders. For the first time ever, our junior doctors have been forced into strike action. Nurses have had their training bursaries removed. It's disgraceful. We need a rolling programme of increased public ownership of clinical, ancillary and back office services. We need our NHS and social care to be publicly funded, publicly owned, publicly provided and publicly accountable. It must be a service that is comprehensive, universal and free at the point of need. We all rely on an NHS. Without our health, we have nothing. Our Labour Party must say no to the privatisation of the NHS, no to the cuts and closures in the NHS and no to the market in the NHS. We do not have to accept the destruction of our National Health Service. The underfunding and by now barefaced privatisation in the NHS is a political choice, not a necessity. We must protect our National Health Service. I move. Francis Priddo, Westminster North, seconding composite seven. Chair and conference, the Tories pretend that cuts in our NHS are inevitable. They refuse to admit that other comparable economies spend more on health care than we do. Their cuts are not an economic necessity. Whatever they say, it's their own deliberate political choice. They, they also pretend they also pretend that NHS cuts can somehow be justified by empty promises of increased social care, even though they're imposing yet further cuts on the local authorities who would have to prov provide that care. Their, their 44 secretive STPs are demanding billions more pounds of what they like to call efficiency savings which can only mean more closures, more reconfigurations, and a double squeeze on staff, even fewer hands and pay frozen once again. The STPs are also designed to devolve the blame for these cuts onto local Labour councillors and doctors, 
So congratulations to Ealing, Hammersmith and Fulham and other Labour councils who have refused to sign up to this latest Tory assault. The junior, doctors, the junior doctors and others who have bravely blown the whistle on what's happening deserve our full support and not just because we need their skills to look after us. Conference, there have been growing outbreaks of resistance all around the country, including this weekend in Liverpool, a march of a thousand people concerned about the future of Liverpool Women's Hospital. <laughs> campaigners, everywhere, campaigners everywhere have found a deep love for our NHS, including among many people who have previously voted Tory. This NHS Composite 7 calls, and I quote, on all sections of the Labour Party to campaign together in its defence. That will need urgent initiatives and sustained attention, both from the Labour movement outside Parliament and also from our representatives within it. Wherever we live, the extent of our NHS campaigning must now be multiplied. If we wait till 2020, we'll be too late. So please, comrades, Vote today for our NHS's future and then think what you can do to step things up from tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Conference. We're now going to take speakers uh, for this debate. Can I see a show of hands? Um, the lady in the red jacket here at the front. Um, the, the, the lady waving at me with the white piece of paper over there towards the back. And uh, the young, young lad with the blue piece of paper that is shaking at me. Thank you. Chair, Conference, Eleanor Smith from Unison, speaking on behalf of the country's largest health union. Conference, the state of the NHS finance could hardly be worse with the NHS Trust across the country reporting that they would be in deficit in the year ahead. The NHS Providers Trade Body, which represents NHS Trust, said recently access to various services could now be seriously cut back we are already seeing increasing open rationing for things like IVF, dermatology and rheumatology. Headline funding figures that suggest the NHS is getting a decent increase marks the reality as money for crucial areas such as the Health Education, the Care Quality Commission and the Public Health is ruthlessly slashed. I guess none of us here were surprised to see the Brexit camp abandoned their ridiculous claim that the NHS would get 350 million extra pounds per week if we left the EU. We always knew it was a lie, and so it has proved to be. The latest plan from the NHS England to try and get round some of these problems is the use of the so-called sustainability and transformation plans across 44 areas of England. In theory, these should lead to some positive changes as they encourage providers to have the care to work with commissioners, local authorities, but the big problem is the lack of money. We know from painful past experience in the NHS, and particularly social care, that when reform is attempted on the cheap, it means cuts, it means patients lose out, and it means that staff suffer too. As always, if the answer to these problems is outsourcing, then you are asking the wrong questions. The theory is that the plans just become a vehicle for cuts and a means of the government shielding itself from the wrath of the public of its failure to fund the NHS adequately. I'm proud to say that my union continues to resist NHS privatisation in all its form. Unison has written to all the NHS chief exec to let them know that such options must not be considered. 
Also, let us not forget the mental health service, where the recent report from the Independent Health Task Force highlighted the chronic underfunding of mental health service. Conference, it is vital that we continue to value our healthcare staff, regardless of which particular parts of the sectors they are working. Let's keep up the fight of our health service. Let's demand a proper funding settlement. Let's make sure we maintain the NHS fit for the 21st century. Let's see the party, Labour Party focus completely on winning power. It's no good being in opposition. Unison member needs Labour government. It leads it to make it happen. Yes. Conference. My name is Karen Lee and I'm a councillor from the East Midlands. I'm a branch chair, a unison activist and an NHS nurse. Thank you. I'm also part of Lincoln CLP's delegation who are all proud to support Jeremy Corbyn. And actually, I've just got to say first, I feel very sad about the direction party democracy has taken this morning. But onward and upward, conference, we have a crisis in our NHS and I'm not sure the general public realise how bad things are. Staff shortages mean that nurses are working flat out, looking after numbers of patients which mean they cannot give the kind of care they would like to give. Conference, on many occasions nurses go home weary, defeated and demotivated and that's not what we trained for. The use of agency nurses costs trusts huge amounts of money they can ill afford. Regular nurses also end up doing large amounts of agency nurses' work, which they are unable or not allowed to do, which places even more pressure on the regular staff. Conference. Stopping nursing bursaries will make it even more difficult to attract those men and women our profession desperately, desperately needs. I was proud to support the junior doctors on the picket line at Lincoln County Hospital, and I'm going to continue with that support. And make no mistake, conference, should the doctors be defeated, the nurses will be next, then the healthcare support workers. And I think I know what, you know that where I'm going with that one. Conference, we must oppose the overnight closure of A&E departments such as Grantham, especially given the depressing regularity with which waiting times are missed. Trusts are massively in debt and this just gets worse year on year. The Tories just view the NHS as an environment within which their friends can make huge profits. Standards of care and safety just don't appear to matter to Jeremy Hunt and his Tory colleagues. Conference, Nye Bevan, the architect of our NHS all those years ago, created an NHS which was free at the point of delivery to all. And it was always hoped that after tackling the initial chronic health issues, the NHS would go on to be a structure which promoted good health in a proactive manner. But sadly, current austerity measures mean that the poverty which persists in places like my hometown of Lincoln means that's not become the case. So conference, we must, first of all, reverse the current level of privatisation, repeal the Health and Social Care Act, support the junior doctors in their fight for fairness, reverse the withdrawal of bursaries, and make sure we deliver up a joined up seamless service for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, conference, conference before, before we hear from the next speaker, can I just uh, choose the next three if you can um, uh, indicate? And these will probably be the last three that we'll be able to take. Um, the lady with the black and orange scarf and the orange dress. Um, oh. <laughs> um, the gentleman with the colourful, multicoloured scarf over there. Um, and I'll take someone from over there. Um, the lady jumping up and down to my left over there. Thank you. Anthony Tucker, West Dorset CLP, and first time delegate to conference. 
Comrades, I have the, uh, the pleasure to represent my CLP. Sadly, it is a constituency represented in Parliament by one Oliver Letwin. And, well, exactly. And back home in our constituency, we see for ourselves the NHS cash crisis, from the hospices in our local area to the Kingfisher Children's Ward, which is threatened with closure. But I make a special plea today on behalf of mental health services. Comrades, I'm 20 years old, but alongside family and friends, I've seen enough of the devastation wreaked by mental illness to serve for an entire lifetime. At the moment, too often, we see mental health services lost as a safe and easy option because we prefer to ignore illnesses we consider to be invisible. This is a false economy. Comrades, we cannot support this. I was proud, very proud to hear Joanna Baxter speak so strongly in support of a proper investment in our mental health services. Only with a properly funded NHS can we deliver the health care for all of our ill people, whether they have an illness we care to see or one we would rather ignore. But this can only happen in a properly funded NHS. This can only happen with a Labour government in power. This can only happen when we win power back and achieve the government this country so desperately needs. <sighs> And equally, I also make this plea as a young LGBT person. It is disproportionately lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals who end up using mental health services. We cannot sit back, comrades. We cannot sit back and do nothing in the face of a mental health crisis when the majority of transgender uh, young people face threat, either attempt or think about suicide. We have to win power. We have to help everybody in this country, whether their illness is visible, invisible, whether we care to deal with it or not. This is... <laughs> Comrades, I don't need to tell you that the government's priorities on this issue are entirely wrong. They favour privatisation. We favour care. When it comes to health, we must win. To protect our NHS and to invest in the future of all young people, regardless of what their illness may be. Conference, I support this motion. Chair, Conference, Sharon Holder from the GMB. GMB represents thousands of carers and workers in the health and care sectors. Thousands of hard-working men and women who really care about what they do. And what they do is important. We don't always realise how important those workers are until a loved one is in need of our support and we are not in the position to look after them. I myself was put in that exact position when my father was diagnosed with dementia. When a loved one is sick, who is it that you want to look after them? Do you want them to be someone who is on the lowest possible pay terms and conditions? Someone who feels um, undervalued, unappreciated, but is still expected to consistently provide emotional and physical support? Of course not. You want a well-trained carer with secure employment rights who has the time to do their job. <laughs> Carers are frontline, vital, skilled public servants who need to be treated as such. Conference. We want to see a proper living wage so carers who work tirelessly don't have to go home and worry about paying their own bills. We need to see an increased ratio of staff to residents so, they don't, so they're not overstretched and struggling. And we want to see meaningful, effective, face-to-face -face training. That means funding our health and care sectors. Cuts to funding have meant local government is forced to use 
council tax to pay private contractors who, have then, who then don't pay carers a living wage. Another example of working people shouldering the burden of the Tory government, refusing to take responsibility for their actions. <laughs> Public sector workers continue to be mercilessly punished for the economic crisis caused by tax avoiders and city boys that our government care more about than their public servants who have kept this, the UK running. GMB supports this motion for more funding for local government, more funding for our care services, proper recognition for our public sector workers and an end to public sector pay cuts. Bartholomew Connection, E. Croydon Central, CLP. Com oh, thank you. Conference, I want to start by thanking the NHS workers up and down this country for the service they do for us every single day, in and out, without complaint, without a moan. I want to thank them for putting up with Jeremy Hunt for the last six years and not walking out on us. But, conference, I want to say this to you. If you look carefully through the composite motion in front of us, it talks about the need to tackle the causes of health problems in this country. Causes like austerity, like inequality, like poverty. My fellow delegates, if you look at a chart of countries across Europe, Britain has some of the worst health problems when it comes to obesity, mental health and life expectancy, we are a consistently poor performer. And you know where else we appear? We appear very high on the list of inequality in Europe, delegates. There is a direct and causal link between the two. Now, the NHS is important, but it is only one part of the solution to the health crisis in this country. If we want to create a healthier population with a better quality of life, with dignity in old age, then we need to tackle the structural problems, not just in our health service, but also in our economy. Delegates, I move this motion. Thank you very much. Um. Com conference, before we um, have our next speaker, um, because they haven't taken their full allocation of time, we can squeeze in one more person. Uh, so um, I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go with the lady with the brolly. <laughs> Conference. I, this won't be a long speech. Um, I'm a first-time delegate and a first-time speaker here. Um, firstly, I would really like to thank Jeremy Corbyn for his a commitment to parity of esteem between mental and physical health care. <laughs> now, I myself live with bipolar disorder, mostly very healthily, but. Um, Earlier this year, due to um, personal life circumstances, I had to have my first ever treatment from community psychiatric nurses and ultimately inpatient psychiatric nurses. And I can't tell you how invaluable their work was. Without them, I don't think that I would be standing here today before you. And so, I would like to ask this to Jeremy Hunt. Do you value nurses so little that you are willing to scrap their funding 
And do you value the lives of people like me so little that you are willing to put our lives at risk? Thank you. Conference, Joyce Still, Unite the Union. Conference, as a health visitor, I welcome the MPF has highlighted the serious falls in perinatal care and specialist units for women who have just given birth and the impact of these cuts. This week, my union, Unite, have organised a week of online events to celebrate the health visiting profession and highlight the important work of health visitors a profession that is over 150 years. Health visitors like myself make a holistic assessment of health needs, endeavouring to deliver a first-class service. But despite providing a much-needed preventative service, this government has made a 200 million in cut year and further deep cuts are planned in the years ahead. It puts the future of our health visiting service under enormous shadow. We can all see what has happened to social care, a service that has always been underfunded and a workforce that has always been undervalued. Social care has experienced service cuts with devastating consequences. Conference, the story of a friend's elderly relative highlights this. Despite their advanced age, chronic health problems and dementia, the assessment she has just had has led to a reduction in her care package. Conference, this lady is 99 years old. It has meant an end to her independence and she will no longer be able to stay in her own home. This has caused considerable distress to her and her relatives. Local councillors, our Tory MP, have been lobbied to try and get a proper care package. But when such severe cuts are being made, it becomes about the budget's bottom line, not the person. My concern is that in this circumstance, it becomes more about who knows how to effectively lobby, not social care on health needs. This lady is lucky, if you can call it lucky, because she has a family who are politi politically active and know how the system works and who to lobby. Conference, I am proud that we are a party that stands for ending austerity and for ending these devastating cuts. But conference, we can't do this in opposition. We can only do this with a Labour government. So I appeal to everybody in this hall, whatever differences we may have had in the past, let's put those be behind us, do what we know best, get behind our elected leader, go on the knocker and campaign for a Labour government. Thank you. Conference, I am now pleased to ask Diane Abbott to reply to the debate. Conference, I am proud to be responding to this debate as Shadow Secretary of State for Health under the leadership of a re-elected Jeremy Corbyn. My mother was a nurse, and preparing for this debate, I tried to think about what she would want me to say. And I realised that what she would want me to say is how precious our NHS is and what back-breaking work being a worker in health and social care is.
and she would want me to do her generation of nurses proud. First of all, I want to talk about the junior doctor's dispute. You will have heard over and over again Jeremy Hunt vilifying the, the BMA and the junior doctors themselves. But it is absolutely clear to the public but the that the responsibility for this dispute lies at the door of Jeremy Hunt himself. Yeah. His arrogance, his mishandling, and his insistence on treating dedicated junior doctors like the enemy within. And the junior doctor's dispute shows us two things. One is the collapse of morale amongst NHS workers as a whole, but it also points to the age-old Tory hostility to people organising at their place of work. The junior doctor's action is, is suspended and we all hope that even at this late stage G Jeremy Hunt will go back into negotiations but conference let there be no doubt labour stands with the junior doctors Another important issue which reflects a wider malaise is the government's decision to withdraw bursaries from student nurses. Many would-be nurses will be frightened of debt and will feel they cannot afford to study to be a nurse. My predecessor, Heidi Alexander, waged a great campaign in Parliament against ending the bursary. And I want to make it clear that Labour will restore the bursary. It takes a team to deliver good health care, we've heard that this is Health Visitors Week and you will all be aware how health visitors and a whole range of aspects of healthcare in the community have been decimated by Tory cuts to local government and to public health. But you know, the Tories have ill repaid the dedication of NHS workers. I know about that dedication my mother came to this country as a pupil nurse and worked in the health service until her retirement. And I would see her come home night after night, completely exhausted. But you know, my mother was so proud of being a nurse, so proud of being in the NHS. The NHS gave her dignity and a vocation and she gave the NHS her absolute commitment and the entirety of her working life. So the next time you hear commentators saying that immigrants are a drain on our public services, think of women like my mother. I want to talk briefly about the NHS and Brexit. In the coming months, the Labour team will be holding the government to account and battling to protect the interests of working people in the Brexit negotiations. But I wish to remind conference that there are 50,000 EU workers in our NHS and 80,000 EU workers in social care 
Our health and social care system depends on these workers, and we need to be clear that an end to freedom of movement could be a disaster for the NHS and social care. And we need to demand assurances from the government about the EU workers already here. You've heard in the excellent speeches in this debate about the funding crisis facing the NHS. I was pleased to address the demonstration earlier in the week to save the Liverpool Women's Hospital. We know that as well as the deep cuts to services, the waiting lists, the missed targets, there's a move towards restricting access to non-urgent operations. This rationing by stealth will affect the poor, the elderly and the vulnerable the most severely. Jeremy Hunt's answer to the 22 billion funding cap are the sustainability and transformation plans that you have heard about. Some of these plans may be a good idea in principle, but let me tell you, increasingly these SDPs look like a vehicle to drive through cuts and closures. I have already led a debate on the SDPs in Parliament, and I can assure conference, where these STPs are purely about cuts, Labour will fight them all the way. Under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, the Labour Party will be committed to halting and reversing the tide of privatisation and marketisation of the NHS. The Health and Social Care Act has fragmented the system, making it so much easier for the private sector to move in. Conference, Labour in government will repeal the Health and Social Care Act. This means returning our NHS to what it was originally conceived as, a publicly owned, publicly funded, publicly accountable universal service as outlined in the NHS reinstatement bill, now being expertly piloted through Parliament by my colleague Margaret Greenwood MP for Rural West, West with the support of the Labour leadership. And I would also like to thank my colleague Justin Madders for all his help and support in the last few months. I can see there are people here from Ellesmere Port. Um, one of the other burdens on our NHS is the huge burden of the private finance initiative. The PFI is costing the NHS over 1.8 billion a year. So, conference. I am here to tell you that Labour in government will not sign another PFI contract. And we want a PFI monitoring unit to support NHS providers in holding contractors to account. Our NHS is there to prevent ill health and treat the sick. It is not there for investment bankers and private equity specialists to rake off profits. We face the gathering storm of a crisis in social care. The Tory government's cuts in funding for local governments has meant big cuts in social care. This means added pressure to the NHS, but it also means added misery and uncertainty for the elderly and their families. Elderly people are bearing the brunt of the cuts 
to the NHS, yet we are the fifth wealthiest country in the world. It is shameful that so many elderly people and their families have to worry about how they will be able to afford the care they need as they age. And Labour is committed both to bringing social care and the NHS together and reviewing our provision of social care so the elderly and their families do not have to struggle as is now the case. My mother was a mental health nurse. I saw through the prism of her working life how mental health has long been the Cinderella of the NHS. But everybody in this hall knows somebody, whether it's a friend, whether it's a family member, whether it's someone in your workforce who's had mental health challenges. And it's made so much worse by the stigma that still surrounds mental health. My predecessor in this role, Andy Burnham, who was also one of our finest health secretaries, did important <laughs> In opposition, he did important campaigning work on the importance of parity of esteem between mental and physical health. And in this parliament, my colleague Luciana Berger has done excellent work campaigning on mental health. But Labour will put the money behind our commitment to parity of esteem. We want an end to shame. We want an end to the tacit acceptance that the mentally ill are somehow second-class citizens in our healthcare system. And we will also prioritise childhood mental health services. <laughs> On Sunday, I visited the Royal Liverpool University Hospital. It is the largest and busiest hospital on Merseyside. I went in order to see for myself the world-class care that they deliver. And I was pleased to meet a team of doctors and consultants working on a Sunday. Jeremy Hunt, why don't you take a visit? And as I was leaving, one of the consultants took my hand and said to me, please save the NHS. It really is the best thing about being British. the most crucial times in our lives, when we are ill, when we are starting our families, when we are elderly, we depend on the NHS. And now, in its time of need, the NHS looks to communities and the labour movement to come together, defend it, campaign for it, and save our NHS.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diane. Conference, I will now ask the Shadow Secretary of State for Wales uh, and Shadow Leader of the House of Commons, Paul Flynn, to address the conference. Good to be back, conference. I last spoke in 1981, and I'm here today as a grateful recipient of Jeremy's Job Creation Schemes for Geriatrics. Is it all over? Is that last 12 months gone? Is that last 12 months when we've been locked in a in a gap year of negativity, of pessimism, of hopelessness by many in our party. It seemed at times that there's a competition to see who can be the most pessimistic about our future and our prospects. We've got to end that. It's time now to give unity a chance. What we should do is take all the bile and the hatred together, put it in a box, bury it deep underground, put six feet of concrete on top, and then put a sign saying, never shall the last 12 months be unearthed from its dishonored grave. We're going forward, comrades, to government. Len McCluskey made a great speech for unity yesterday, but there's one uh, phrase in it, the one that he stole from Shakespeare, that I must disagree with, because he did say that some should depart the field. No, no, no. The Tories have already got their A-team on the field, and we've got some of our best people sitting there on the subs bench. You don't score goals from the subs bench. We need them all back. Many resigned in that awful period three months ago. Some resigned, they all did through for honorable reasons. It took courage for many of them to resign. It's going to take greater courage for many of them to come back. And we must make it possible for them to return with dignity and respect. The trouble with unity is that it's not sexy. The press, the media aren't interested in it. They're interested in rows, they're interested in division, they're interested in conflict, but they don't notice the brilliant year we've had. Magnificent election results. Instead of the polls, look what happens when real people use real votes in real elections. Marvelous results in all the mayoral elections, in all the by-elections. In Wales, we gained three parliamentary seats that we lost a year ago. There have been successes, too, in the Commons, working with our comrades in the Lords. We've done a great deal to force U-turns on the government, on the personal independence payments, on Sunday training Lords, selling prison contracts to Saudi Arabia. All those things have been achieved in opposition, working intelligently uh, with others in the House of Commons. Do you remember David Cameron? He was so prime ministerial. He was so wonderful. He had his 100-pound haircuts and 1,000-pound suits. And what's happened to him? I mean, he's just exploded in disgrace. He's wrecked his own career, and he's done great damage to this country. The heart of our democracy is rotten. And the last act of David Cameron was to shower benefits, eh, honors, peerages on his cronies and his donors. The Daily Mail, of all people, described his honors list as devalued, debased, discredited, egregious, grubby, tawdry, tainted, tarnished, Otherwise, all right. <laughs> if they think that, and we look at the House of Lords, the new elected Tory Speaker said we've got 200 peers too many, more than there are MPs. We've now got a position where there's a whole 
pile of, uh, of new laws, new business, new work being dumped on the Commons because of Brexit. We're losing 73 MEPs. Is this the time to cut the number of MPs and further bloat the House of Lords, the unelected House of Lords? They favour one reform, one small reform only, and that's boundary changes, which will, of course, hit us. And boundary changes are at best an irrelevance and at worst a cheat that robs two million of our electorate of their votes. They're disenfranchised by this. We've got to stop this nonsense. And we've got to say to the government, we need a root and branch reform of our democracy. The only house in the world where we have uh, chieftains, hereditary chieftains in the parliament is ourselves and Lesotho. Only another country in the world, Iran, has clerics as lawmakers. We need a thorough reform of our democracy, but it must be done on an all-party basis. It must be done with the consent of all parties so we get a fresh democracy that's fair, that's durable, that's democratic. It can come, but in the meantime, we forget this Tory cheat of boundary changes and consign it to the dustbin. I'd like to tell you, many people have given personal stories uh, on this. I'd like to indulge in one of mine. Uh, in the 1945 election, I and my brother, Michael, uh, were working for the Labour Party. Hard to believe, 10 years old. And my mother drew us to one side and said, look, boys, you're on the right side. It's the Labour Party. It's our party. But this candidate cannot win because of prejudice. You cannot win in Wales as a, as a candidate if you've got an Irish name. And no one called Jim Callaghan has any future in politics. <laughs> And I did tell her years later, I did remind her of that, but there was pessimism for you. And that was a generation, the ones who we inherit the, from them, we inherit from my parents, my grandparents, those wonderful generations of people who had no wealth but marvelous vision and have given us this great inheritance of socialist achievements. We can't let those past generations down because of differences between ourselves that are petty and transitory. From henceforth, we are one party. Only the friends of Tories will say anything else. We have one leader, we have one set of opponents, and they're the Tories, and we have one direction in which we're going, and that's forward to a Labour government. Thank you, comrades. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Conference, we are still running behind schedule, so uh, the CAC has agreed that the cooperative party speaker will be taken this afternoon. We now welcome our guest speaker to bring greetings from the Trades Union Congress. Liz Snape is the outgoing president of the TUC and was born and grew up in Liverpool, where she was also a student union president and an NUS activist. She joined the National Association of Local Government Officers as a legal officer, then worked on equal opportunities and European policy before becoming Unison's Director of Policy and Political Affairs in 2006. In 2012, she was appointed as one of Unison's three women Assistant General Secretaries, overseeing the union's communications and political and campaigning work. She has served on the Women at Work Commission and the Health and Safety Executive and has been a champion for both women's rights and health and safety. Liz, a warm welcome to Labour Party Conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, friends. And it really is a great honour to be here today to bring solidarity greetings from the TUC and to congratulate Jeremy 
on his election. We will work with you to build for our members. And I'm proud too to be here in Liverpool, my home city, a city with a proud socialist tradition, a city that far too often has been trashed and vilified by the media, but a city that today stands proud once more in the world, thanks to the hard work of its great people and its Labour Council. And today, friends, the link between Labour and our great trade union movement has never mattered more. Our shared values of fairness, of equality, of respect have never been more crucial because the battle is on. The fight for all we hold dear, our public services, our welfare state, our industries, that fight for our shared vision of a better world, a world that works for the many and not just the few, and that offers hope to those that live in fear and in poverty. And a word too about those who come to our shores seeking a better life. And as trade unionists, let us make it clear. It's not migrants who are the problem in our country. It's those unscrupulous bosses who seek to abuse them by cutting pay and cutting traditions. They are the problem. And that's why we need unity to challenge the Tories and to challenge those bosses, to fight for our class like the Tories do. And this year, when the Tories came at us with their vicious Trade Union Act, we showed our strength and we showed our fight. Conference, they thought they could silence us and they failed. They thought they could crush us and they failed. They thought they could finish off Thatcher's dirty work and do us in. But conference, they failed. And they failed because we stood together. Woo. Our Labour family at its very best, MPs, the House of Lords, every union, big and small, affiliated and non-affiliated, one focus and one fight back. And that's how it must be. To fight for our NHS now teetering on the brink against zero hours contracts, to challenge the rise in sexism in the workplace and the vile and vicious rise in racism unleashed by Brexit. That is our challenge. So we're at a critical point in our history, our proud Labour history. And if there's one lesson we should never forget, it's that our people in our class were never handed anything on a plate. Nothing was given graciously and nothing came without a fight. So that old saying, unity is strength, has never mattered more. So in the battles ahead, let's stand together as trade unionists, as party members and as friends, treating each other with dignity and respect. And that includes our party staff, all proud trade unionists too. They have our full support. So conference, there is no better time, no better moment, and certainly no better city to celebrate the ties that have bound us together for over a hundred years. Party and unions as one. Fighting the Tories, not each other. Organising together, campaigning together, and conference winning together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Liz. Conference, our final speaker this morning is perhaps the most famous son of a bus driver in the history of the human race. But, but 
before, before we hear from Sadiq, uh, we have a short film. Sadiq Khan has won more than 50% of the votes cast in the round, and I'm therefore delighted to declare Sadiq Khan selected as Labour candidate for the Mayor of London. I'm overwhelmed. I'm deeply humbled. I'm determined to repay your faith by winning the mayoral election next May and making a real difference to Londoners' lives. And of course, all eyes are on the London race and on this man, Sadiq Khan. Labour fielded a charismatic Muslim candidate from a working class district. The Tories, on the other hand, ran Eton educated Zach Goldsmith. I'm a Bollywood fan, so anything with a Bollywood theme, I'm looking, I will lap it up. It does write itself a wonderful story of a working class kid who made good, absolutely committed to the life of London versus Zach Goldsmith. As the returning officer, hereby declare the results as follows. Sadiq Aman Khan, Labour Party, 1,148,716. London is a city embarking on a new journey after voting in its first ever Muslim mayor. Sadiq Khan is spending his first week on the job after winning the biggest personal mandate of any politician in British history. He also told BBC Today in that interview that he was supporting Hillary Clinton, Tamron, and he added, quote, I hope she trounces him in talking about Trump. My name is Sadiq Khan and I'm the mayor of London. I promise to always be a mayor all Londoners, to work hard, to make life better for every Londoner, regardless of your background, and to do everything in my power to ensure you get the opportunities that our incredible city gave to me. Labour in power. Not just talking the talk, but walking the walk too. Never, never sacrificing or selling out on our ideals, but putting them in action every single day. Not a revolution overnight, but real and meaningful change that makes life easier for the people who need it most. Conference, after the election this summer, the leadership of our party has now been decided, and I congratulate Jeremy on his clear victory. <laughs> now it's time for us to work together towards the greatest prize, getting Labour back into power. Conference, with Labour in power, your home and your commute get more affordable. The air you breathe gets less polluted. You get better pay and conditions at work. Our businesses are supported to grow and new jobs are created. With Labour in power, Britain is a fairer country, a more equal country and a more just country. And Labour is in power right now. Not just in London, but in Wales too. Labour re-elected with the First Minister, Carwin Jones. And in Bristol with the new Mayor, Marvin Rees. Labour is in power right now in Liverpool, Manchester, and Southampton, in Newcastle, Glasgow and Cambridge, 
In Birmingham, Nottingham, Leeds and Cardiff too, Labour is in power in towns and cities the length and breadth of Britain. And conference, where Labour is in power, it's thanks to your hard work. Thanks to Labour members, activists and supporters. Thanks. Thanks to the trade unions and the working people they represent. Thanks to the Labour staff who work so hard for us. And thanks to every single Labour councillor, Member of Parliament, Assembly member and MSP who walk the streets and knock on doors come rain or shine, who deliver Labour leaflets and who listen to the voters and who make the communities they represent day in and day out better. I want to say... I want to say thank you to you all from the very bottom of my heart for your role in putting Labour in power and going above and beyond to help us win back London in May. Because it's only when Labour is in power that we get the chance to fix the problems that we care most about. Like the housing crisis, with Labour out of power, the number of affordable new homes built falls. The cost of rent rockets and the number of homeless people sleeping on our streets rises. But it's only with Labour in power that we can make tackling the housing crisis our number one priority. We can create new teams like Homes for Londoners to get more genuinely affordable homes built. Or a new social letting scheme to stop renters being ripped off. We can enact new policies like the London Living Rent to put home ownership back within reach for our young people. And we can make tackling homelessness and rough sleeping a real priority because it's a stain on our great nation. Of course, <laughs> of course, we always have to be honest. We won't be able to fix the housing crisis overnight. It's too serious and entrenched a problem. But it's only with Labour in power that we, we can make a real start and a real difference. Take air quality and pollution. When Labour is out of power, nowhere near enough is done to clean up our filthy air. Nearly 10,000 Londoners die every year from air so filthy it's actually illegal. Rather than taking action to clean up our air, the government fought against this tooth and nail in the courts. Once again, it's only with Labour in power that we can make a real difference. With world-leading new approaches like an ultra-low emission zone, stretching from the North Circular to the South Circular. And by putting in... And by putting in the resources and effort required to create the first clean bus areas in Britain. To ensure that we only buy truly clean buses from 2018. All of this is only possible when Labour is in power. Take social integration. With Labour out of power, we've just been through a divisive and bruising EU referendum campaign. With Labour out of power, the future of EU citizens in Britain, who came here because they want to work and contribute, is being used as a bargaining chip. Well, that's wrong, and I'll tell you this, the government should be ashamed. I don't want to take a moment to speak to the European citizens living across Britain and who make a huge contribution to our NHS, schools, and construction sites, and in business. You make a massive contribution to our country, economically, socially, and culturally. And my message to you is thank you. Thank you for all that you do to make our country great. You are welcome here.
Meanwhile, with Labour out of power, hate crime is rising, whether anti-Semitic, Islamophobia, homophobia, or any other form of this vile crime. Extremism is a growing problem, whether in the Muslim community or on the far right, and the gap between the richest and the poorest in our society continues to grow. But we can only take action to make our communities more cohesive and to strengthen social integration if Labour is in power. It's only with Labour in power that we can give social integration the priority it deserves by appointing Britain's first Deputy Mayor for Social Integration or creating London's first economic fairness team to fight for rights at work and better pay and conditions. It's only, it's only with Labour in power that we can have leaders who are proud to call themselves a feminist, that we can have that we can have real gender pay audits and real plans to tackle pay inequality, or ensure that at least half of the people we appoint are women. It's only with Labour in power that we can ensure that minority communities have a real sense of belonging, so they're as resilient as possible to extremism and radicalisation. It's only with Labour in power that we can build bridges rather than walls, to bring our communities together, not keep them apart. Of course, conference, Labour is not in power in the place we can have the biggest impact in our country, in Parliament. It's in government that Labour can make the biggest changes to people's lives. And every day now, we see what happens when Labour's not in power. We see the reintroduction of grammar schools, which will leave too many children behind and deepen inequality in our country. We see that the government has no plan for leaving the EU. We see that in 2016, someone's pay and career prospects can still be defined by their gender. We've seen six years of damage to the services that people rely upon, to the NHS, to schools, to social care. The people who need us the most are those who suffer the most when Labour is not in power. Conference. Conference, let me end by saying this. Labour out of power will never, ever be good enough. We can only improve lives with Labour in power, by winning elections, by putting Labour values into action every day. Real Labour values, equality, social justice and opportunities for all. It's only with Labour in power can we create a fairer, more equal and more just Britain. And will Labour's not in power we fail the very people who need us the most. So conference, my message today is clear. It's our duty and our responsibility to put Labour back in power across Britain. We have to start by winning the mayoral elections next year in Liverpool, Manchester and Birmingham and ensuring Labour is in power in every great city in Britain. Because with Labour in power, in cities and regions, we can show that our party can be trusted to govern again. With Labour in power, we can demonstrate that we can make a real difference to people's lives. And with Labour in power, we can prove that we're ready for government. Conference, it's time to put Labour back in power. It's time for a Labour government, a Labour Prime Minister in Downing Street, a Labour cabinet, Labour values put into action. Conference, it's time we put Labour back into power. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Sadiq. Uh, conference, we will now take the votes on uh, this morning's debate. Uh, first, the NEC statement on the leader's policy plan. Can I see all those in favour of accepting the statement? And all those against? That's carried. Uh, next, the NEC, NEC statement on international trade. Can I see all those in favour of accepting the statement? And all those against? That's carried. Uh, contemporary Composite 9 on housing, which was moved by Gravesham CLP. Can I see all those in favour? And all those against? That's carried. Contemporary Composite 7 on the NHS, moved by Sutton and Cheam CLP. Can I see all those in favour? And all those against? That's carried. The Health and Care Policy Commission annual report. Can I see all those in favour? All those against? That's carried. And the health and care priorities issue document, can I see all those in favour? And all those against? That's carried. Uh, conference, we now move to the votes on the rule changes. Uh, these must be taken by card vote, and they will be card votes one to five. Uh, the rule changes to be moved by Wimbledon CLP and Erewash CLP were not moved, so card votes six and seven will not be taken. The summary of the votes and the NEC recommendations are in CAC report number three and on the screen directly behind me. You should cast all seven of your votes, at, or sorry, all five of your votes at the same time. Please remain in your seats whilst the vote is being taken. Conference for, for delegates who haven't yet voted, if you, when you voted, if you could hold your ballots up so that they can be collected, that will be a big help. Thank you.
make sure there's no... Um, can I, conference, can I ask anybody who hasn't yet voted, if you just stand up and wave your vote so that we can make sure everything is collected. So there's a group over there I think we need to get to. Is there anybody else who's yet to vote? If you could stand and wave. That's it, I think you can close, close the session. Okay, thank you, conference. Conference will now adjourn to 2.15 p.m. Thank you.